second this is so the recording is on this is the monthly meeting of the transportation and public safety committee i'm sydney meyer i'm the chair esther blout who i don't see in my list but i hope she's here she's on she's on esther welcome as the new vice chair of the committee thank you if you'd like like to say a, a few words, please feel free. If not, we'll go right to the. We can go right to the meeting. Okay, thank you. So, uh, John, why don't you call the roll, please? Sure. And committee members, turn your mics on, so we'll make it quicker. Uh, Sydney Meyer. Present. Esther Blount. Present. John Quint, secretary. Present. Ernest Augustus. Uh, here. Sandy Balboza. I saw Sandy signed in. I don't know if that's her. We'll come back. Juliet Cullen Chung. Here. John Dew. Cheryl Gelt. Kate Gilman. Brian Howell. Here. I saw you in. Okay, Brian. Uh, Patrick Kalaki. Here. Nicole Murray. Here. <clears throat> Ciro Scala. All right. Uh, let me go back. Sandy Balboza, are you here? No. And John Du, who usually is on. I didn't see him sign in. Okay. Still the corn. Okay. So anybody else who comes later. Okay, the first thing on the uh, is the adoption of the agenda. I have two changes to make. The Department of Transportation announced that they will not be doing the Willoughby Avenue update, uh, Willoughby Avenue Open Street update tonight. They will do it at a future meeting, but they were not prepared for it tonight. Uh, so I would ask those of you who are here who want to discuss this that we have the community forum. In the community forum, you can. You will have two minutes to say whatever you would like to say about the Willoughby Avenue, if you'd like to do that, do so. You could also send a uh, uh, use the chat to send a comment if you wish, and you can also notify the community board either by email at the community board's address, or those of you who wish to do it by regular stale mail can do so too. Now, in addition, it is our uh, in this committee that what we do where it says open session for public comment, we do that actually in the, in the, when their presentations, we do that in the presentation. So we will give uh, the public uh, the ability to both ask questions if they want and to make comments. We ask the, you to limit your comments to two minutes. Uh, and uh, Taya is indicating that Willoughby Avenue will be on the June agenda, uh, which will, which the June agenda may or may not, June meeting may or may not be live because the uh, uh, emergency declaration that allows open meeting ends before that. Whether it will be extended on, I don't, do not know. But in any case, that we allow comments for and questions during presentations in the Q and A period. We ask non-committee members to limit that to two minutes. Uh, committee members, both board members and committee members can have a little bit longer. I try to give everybody at least one question uh, or comment be, of members before I turn it over to the uh, a community for their input. And we frankly are always happy to get the input because the input makes our deliberations more knowledgeable. So I ask for those changes to the uh, agenda to uh, I move the adoption of the of the amended agenda. Do I have a motion, please. A motion to approve. Second. Any opposition? Hearing no opposition, it's passed unanimously. Uh, approval of the minutes from April of 2002. Where I, where I was in, when I was in Poland. Uh, any additions, subtractions, amendments, modification to the minutes, the April minutes? 
Ernie, I can't hear you. Uh, no, I, I don't have any. Thank you. I have a motion to approve the uh, uh, minutes? So I'll move. Any opposition? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Nicole Murray is home ill today and will just be joining us for district level crash statistics. Nicole, are you on? Yes. Nicole, please take the floor. Can you guys hear me? I can. All right, I apologize for my voice and no video, but I haven't been feeling well. Um, okay, so I actually wanted to start with the six month chart to sort of give an overview of what's been happening in the community board district. Um, so the blue bars, for those who are not familiar with my, my charts, are the number of crashes that have happened with injuries in the community board. And the lines represent uh, the individual injuries with the red line being the total. So they're going to be more uh, individual injuries and crashes because a crash might have more than one injury. So we can see from this six month uh, period where it's a drop in January, which is somewhat common because people are out of town and so on. We're kind of, while, um, the number of crashes has remained sort of flat. We had um, 54 in February, 49 in March, and 51 uh, last month. The injuries have kind of are kind of going up somewhat. So it was 50 total injuries in February and 60 in um, April. Um, so not a great trend. However, I will say that based on past years' data it typically follows this type of trend where January is a low point and then it starts ticking up again and back down during holidays. And this is somewhat lower compared to previous years. I kind of take 2020 and 2019 as a throwaway year because um, you have COVID, but in previous years, um, these numbers tended to be a lot higher. So actually the number of, of uh, crashes is um, lower than typical, but uh, it's kind of going back up again. So to get to the monthly stats um, and, and the map of where they're happening, actually, let's go to the live map. Um, they're, you know, again, the usual suspects, Tillery Street, uh, Flatbush, all along Atlantic, Flushing and Park, the main thoroughfares. This is where a lot of the crashes are happening as usual. So I know that our community board has the capital improvements that we can request. And so, uh, you know, I would suggest to use this information to see where we can have more improvements, uh, especially around this, this, this particular corner uh, is always pretty gnarly, Tillery Street and Boren Place. Um, so when we're doing our capital request to, to focus on these areas, um, it just seems to be getting a little bit more, um, you know, we have fewer crashes, but they're a little bit more dangerous. Are there any questions? There's one question about where's the crashes about bike and, pedest and pedestrian show? Um, what, what do you like separately or um, it's all kind of grouped together, but I could split it out here on the on the chart. Um, uh, it's split up by type. So way down at the bottom, thankfully, there haven't been too many fatalities, but we have pedestrian fatalities and pedestrian injuries towards the bottom. Cyclists injuries and fatalities have been motorists. So it's grouped, it's separated like that. Um, was there something else that you were looking for? It wasn't me. I was someone else. I was asking. I don't know. I was just yeah to to the person who's asking. And, and just one one point. It's John uh, Nicole. It's actually Tillery and Adams. Oh, sorry. <laughs> big difference. Uh, you know. Um, so. I'm on the other side, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's. I just want to make sure that people realize. You know, it's not because it would be Fulton and Borum, but that big red circle is Tillery and Adams. Okay, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions to, for Nicole? I just say that it's hard to tell the difference between the traffic accidents and the ones that's the bike and the pedestrians. I know she just explained it, but um remember we you, call we call them crashes first of all. Can you say it again how you can tell the difference? Oh, are you looking for incidents that are between uh cyclists and pedestrians or that it affect that a pedestrian or cyclist was involved i guess either one just i just um, need to know to see the 
Yeah, so this chart right here is just going to be whether or not one was involved. So this particular chart doesn't say um, if it was like car on car or it's never pedestrian on pedestrian, but you know, one way or the other. Um, but you can use this tool to uh, do that. Um, I, I've never, let's see if we can do this. So this is the month. Um, I think we can do, we can filter out. Yeah, the thing is I can't, oh, here we go. So we can do bicycle or e-bike and then That's correct, Nicole. It would be pedestrian, just filter out for everything but pedestrian on the filter by crash type. Yeah. So there's been three. One on decal with an injury. And it doesn't say, I'm not sure who was injured here. I can't, like pedestrian. So the pedestrian was injured on decal and then a few, again, still artillery. So artillery what, seems to be, go ahead. What happens if you unclick bicycle? We're left with the two. And once so the, like, so of, of the three incidents, two were a scooter and a pedestrian, and one was a bicycle and pedestrian. Uh, it looks like two were e-bike or scooter. The the thing about the what sometimes the the e-bikes and scooters are mis um mischaracterized miscategorized, so it's a little bit unreliable. But I have here selected the vehicle type was an e-bike or scooter, so that could be like a moped even. Right. So no, much, yeah. Um, and then any, these it's two, anything that it's anything that's motorized. Yeah. Sometimes they're miscategorized, but uh, I'm aware. Is, yeah. Um, so interesting two, about this is that there's no way to filter by number of cyclists that were injured by a pedestrian because <laughs> it only it only counts vehicle types as potential injurers. Yeah, I wouldn't say if somebody jumped down into the bike lane or something. I, I don't know if how that would be reported. Um, no, but, one uh, way you reported a bike and a pedestrian. Yeah. They, but they don't, it, they, this is, they don't indicate the cause. It's just reported as a bike and a pedestrian. Yeah, they, and this also does also, this would be injury. So if we said like no injury and fatality, um, e-bike or scooter, yeah, it's one. Gonna... Yeah, it's one. But if we did car, it would be like, it's like 6,000. So... All right. Um, Nicole, I have a question. Yes. Um, there was an accident um, on May 11th. Do you have that? It was at Smith and Atlantic, and I believe it was through uh, with a, an e-bike and a tractor trailer, but I'm not sure. Do you have that yet? Oh, so I actually, I only do the month before, so I have the full month, so I don't have May in, in my information here. Yeah, but it probably would be on this if we just change this to May. Well, maybe um, you maybe not. It may not show up. Yeah, yet. exactly. But I when I do our reports, I do for the month prior so that it's complete. Right. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Feel better. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the downtown Brooklyn shared streets. Commissioner Bray and uh, Emily. Are you on? Yeah, that's actually, that actually wouldn't be me. I'm going to pass it over to Jessica Constein. That's um, fine. I'm just turning it over to you because you're listed on my list. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to make whatever changes you need. Now, is Jessica on? Yep. Hi, I'm here. Hi. Um, I'll just pass it over to you and you can get started. Great. And I also am joined by the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And I'm sorry, my computer is being very slow, so bear with me. That's okay, Ms. Constant. A little trick that might help is if you could turn off the video so we won't be able to see your face, mm -hmm. but that will that should free up some bandwidth for your screen sharing. Hmm. That doesn't um, maybe let's stop screen sharing and try and restart that. 
Ms. Cronstein, did we lose you? Yes, yeah, I'm here, sorry. Um, can you not see, let's see. No, we can't see your screen sharing yet. Oh, not at all? Okay. Not at all, it just says your screen sharing has started. What uh, Taya suggested, you shut it off and try coming back on again. How about now? Nope. It just says uh, it just has started screen sharing, and nothing is showing. That's frustrating. Okay. Um. So maybe um I know uh, May. Do you have the deck handy? Could you share screen? I yes. I'm pulling it up right now. Hey, May. Oh, Apologies. No problem. No problem. Thanks, May. Yeah. No problem. So let me close all the other things on my computer. One second. Sorry. <laughs> Trying to free up bandwidth as well. And this was easier last time from Poland. <laughs> okay. Can everyone see the screen? It was there for a second and then you stopped sharing. Oh, that's bizarre. Uh, there you go. There you go, that's it. There we go, we can see it. All right, Jessica, let me know um, when you want to uh, move forward so I can help with the slides. Great, thank you. So next slide. Um, so we are here tonight to talk about the proposed shared streets for downtown Brooklyn for 2022. Um, we are building on um, the, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnerships um, work on their um, public realm action plan. And so I think I'm going to hand it over to May and she can talk through that and how that um, sort of is shaping this project. And then um, I'll take it from there. Uh, sure. Sorry, one second. My... I'm also going to stop my video. Hopefully this will um, move along faster. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, many of these slides you've seen in the past um, uh, through our, uh, different briefings that um, Belinda Cape and I have given to uh, CB2. Um, but again, we're really excited to announce um, some progress and updates for our plan. Um, just as a reminder, this was a uh, plan that we started in um, late 2018, uh, working with a number of city agencies, as well as a consultant team led by Gerke Engels Group and WXY Architecture and Urban Design to really look at and prepare downtown Brooklyn, um, uh, looking at the above ground uh, pedestrian experience and preparing the district for uh, the future. Um, again, uh, we looked at and are attempting to address five main buckets of um, challenges that we've heard from a num number of stakeholders. Uh, first and foremost, the lack of green space as the district is dominated by a lot, a lot of asphalt and concrete. Uh, multimodal conflict and ve vehicular congestion. Um, now that the community board was just listening to crash data um, in the district and we you know, wanna make sure we can do everything as possible to make uh, our streets safer for um, all users. Um, third, the narrow sidewalks and illegal parking that, um, and placard parking that we abuse, we abuse that we see throughout the district. Um, many of the sidewalks, um, especially in the core of downtown Brooklyn, the streets really um, bordering or um, bordered by Willoughby Street at, um, to the north, Skimmerhorn Street to the south, uh, Adams or Court and um, Flatbush have very narrow sidewalks of uh, less than nine feet. Um, this was particularly challenging during COVID, during the height of COVID as well. Um, and then also um, the district is wide and diverse in terms of uses as well as um, the uh, built structures and the built environment. We're also at a point where uh, three different grids um, intersect causing for some confusion as we navigate um, the district. And lastly, looking at how we can improve the streetscape and also use that as a means of establishing a district-wide identity. Um, so our vision for downtown Brooklyn is really to work on a people-focused downtown, inclusive and dynamic with outdoor space, um, streets, sidewalks, public spaces that can be used by all um, for everything from active recreation to 
uh, just re relaxation and respite. Also wanting to make sure that we um, continue to maintain being the hub for jobs and businesses, not just for Brooklyn, but for the region. Um, and that uh, we can also, also make sure that we're a safe and accessible transit hub for commuters, um, particularly for bicycle uh, commuters as well as pedestrians. And then thirdly, um, we wanna make sure that we're a district that really speaks to Brooklyn's identity and culture. Um, we are a very diverse uh, borough and um, a number and are a place where a number of communities and cultures intersect. Um, and uh, we also have the Brooklyn Cultural District. So we wanna look at ways that we can integrate the arts and our diverse culture through streetscape and some of the design elements. Um, as many of you may remember, um, we started our work in uh, late 2018 and um, have also held a number of workshops, uh, stakeholder meetings with our public realm steering committee, um, as well as meetings with CB2, both uh, the general board and the transportation committee. So we're excited to come back to you today to share the progress that we've made, um, in, uh, particularly in the last couple of months with our partners at DOT. Um, a reminder of our goals, um, we want to make sure that we expand the shared street network, which is where, what we're here to talk about today. We'll also, we're still looking at um, ways of making um, the streets, sidewalks, and our infrastructure, um, uh, infrastructure that prioritizes people. Um, also looking at how we can increase biodiversity and green infrastructure. These aren't mutually exclusive goals, so our shared streets plan will attempt to integrate many of these um, aspects. And then also establishing a vibrant um, downtown experience, really planning for the future, looking at redesigning and reimagining public spaces that prioritize people and the environment. Um, so again, um, this is an image of um, our street network today. Uh, as you can see in the red, we have a number of narrow and substandard sidewalks, um, but we also have an existing um, uh, four or so blocks of shared street. And we're proud to be home to Brooklyn's first um, and only shared street at the moment. Um, and we want to slowly work with both the public and private sector in um, extending curbs and pedestrianizing more of the core of the downtown. Um, so uh, the pink is where the existing Willoughby shared street is along Pearl and Willoughby. Um, today, uh, Jessica is going to talk more about the expanded areas that we're hoping to uh, start um, this summer, um, Bridge between Willoughby and Fulton, Hoyt between Fulton and Skimmerhorn, as well as Elm Place. And then looking into the future, we're also, we'd like to work with DOT and the nearby stakeholders to extend um, Bridge from uh, Metro Tech or the Brooklyn Commons campus to Willoughby as well as the uh, block of Albee Square West after uh, abolition is placed and some of the other adjacent developments are complete. So I wanna to speak to a few different elements of the shared street that um, we're rolling out with DOT that really encompasses some of our goals. First, um, we are looking at um, uh, integrating a more distinct system of planters that will allow for kind of understory plantings like this image of Elm Place, as well as full street trees. Um, we're very happy that with um, our partners with our partners at DOT and the Public Design Commission, um, we we're able to get district-wide approval for a number of these larger planters um, that can accommodate street trees and will act as an edge object to protect the pedestrian spaces of the shared streets. Also, we are working with DOT on their art interventions program um, and looking to um, work with a local artist to um, add art and more vibrant colors into the pedestrian uh, spaces, the shared street only. So this will not be in the roadway for vehicles, but will be again in the um, kind of curb expansion areas, similar to this image of Freeman Plaza um, in Hudson Square, as well as similarly to Alloy's um, installation at Temple Square. So we've started a RFP process um, uh, targeting um, local Brooklyn-based artists, um, as well as MWB artists. Um, and I have worked with DOT uh, in a small selection committee to whittle that down. And we're excited to make an announcement soon and begin installing that art um, in the coming months. Jessica, back to you. Great, thank you. Um, so next slide. 
so back to this sort of overall vision slide, right? I think um, May talked a little bit about all of the analysis that they did to start to identify where they would like to see shared streets. I think, um, you know, we see, especially this round in 2022 of these proposed shared streets as um, really a way to build on that analysis and, and that all of that outreach that they did, but um, to really work on our sort of shared goals between the DOT and the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. So, you know, our goals with this project are to strengthen pedestrian connections, enhance safety, and improve the public realm, as well as create public space and add public space amenities. Um, and that's really building both on the analysis and all the work that the, that the partnership has done for their public realm action plan, but also all of the work that we've already done in the area with our shared streets on Pearl and Willoughby and all of our existing plazas. Uh, next slide. Um, so, along with the outreach that, that the partnership did specifically for the Public Realm Action Plan, um, we this spring did a bunch of outreach together about these three streets specifically. Um, and so we did a um, public outreach day um, on Alby Square on March 19th, where we collected feedback from community members about what they would want to see and, and some of the issues that they've seen along these corridors. Um, and then uh, the partnership has also done a huge amount of stakeholder outreach to um, Belltown Lofts, Brooklyn Prospect School, um, Avalon Willoughby Square, um, Nimbus DoorDash, um, really all of the the businesses and buildings and ownership that are adjacent to um, these corridors that we're working on this year. Next slide. Um, and so looking at first at bridge, right? So this is Bridge Street today. Um, you can see that it is both um, not super inviting but also um, there are, while there are many cars parked, there are not a lot of cars actually driving through the space. So what we want to do, next slide. Um, next slide is add circulation space around the subway station entrances. That's where we've seen it get really crowded in the past, um, add public space. Um, to accommodate pickup drop off around the school. When we spoke to the school, they were really excited about the opportunity to um, have a place for parents to wait for their kids, to meet their kids um, on the street that could um, accommodate things like seating, um, add amenities like bike parking um, in the mid block. So that would be building on the Nimbus um, site, uh, Nimbus DoorDash site, um, and really giving them a place to park their bikes, but also um, a place to be. Um, and then um, also, as, as May mentioned, um, our DOT art program is working with them. Um, and, you know, the art will go through the standard DOT review process, but we'll be adding DOT or adding asphalt art to all of these pedestrian spaces um, with the partnership. Next slide. So looking a little bit at what that means in terms of um, the current parking regulations. Um, so what we would be maintaining is the three hour metered parking. We would also, um, and we see that as a way to really accommodate um, the deliveries that need to happen around here. Um, and then the taxi stand, um, we just don't actually see being used by taxi stands or by taxis, sorry. Um, and so really transitioning that to more of the metered parking um, than um, what is out there right now while maintaining access for loading needs. Next slide. Um, and then also maintaining access to the loading docks on the, on the street. So designing to accommodate, um, accommodate all of those delivery needs, um, as well as maintaining vehicular pickup drop off access to some of the adjacencies that front onto the onto bridge. Next slide. 
And so looking at Hoyt, um, again, um, it's, you know, the public realm is not, I mean, well, it's actually more inviting over here where, where the partnership has already done some work, um, but also the sidewalks are much narrower than we see the typical volumes, um, especially around the, the subway station entrance. Um, next slide. And so here, um, what we're looking at doing is adding circulation space around the subway station entrances, mirroring the, the amenities that have already been added around 11 Hoyt, um, and then adding asphalt art in all the pedestrian spaces. Uh, next slide. Again, looking at um, what this means for parking, this is all signed as truck loading. I think what we um, found in all of our outreach is that the really important piece here is the loading access for Macy's. So maintaining that space in the mid block um, to really make sure that we're accommodating um, what's necessary. Next slide. Um, and then again, maintaining vehicular access to 11, 11 Hoyts Port de Cochere. Um, so making sure that vehicles can make the turns into there. Um, so accommodating access to all the driveway as well, also maintaining access to the block for pickup drop off, things like that. Next slide. Um, and then Hoyt, the second block of Hoyt um, between Livingston and Skirmahorn. Um, again, this is another block where, where the um, sidewalk space does not meet um, pedestrian needs. Next slide. Where, where are the pedestrians? And so looking at um, adding public space and public space amenities um, around the complementary adjacencies like Bella Pizza, um, Livingston Manor, um, accommodating um, uh, enhancing safety, slowing traffic through the block, um, expanding public space, um, and then um, also accommodating the pickup drop off to 45 port uh, Hoyt. Excuse me. Slide. And then again, slowing traffic through the slowing through traffic um, while accommodating pickup drop off at 45 Hoyt um, and prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists. Slide. Um, so Elm Place today, um, I think the the sort of the thing to note here is that um, again we have the the subway entrance, but we also have this really active front with Frank's Fresh Fruit and Drinks with the hot dog um, vendor. Um, so um, next slide. So the partnership um, as part of all of this outreach that they've done uh, made sure to coordinate with the Fulton Hot Dog King. This space will accommodate their sort of outdoor, outdoor dining uses. Um, and so what we are aiming to do here is add circulation space around the subway station entrances, expand public space and add public space amenities. Again, we've coordinated with um, the Fulton Hot Dog King and again, adding asphalt art. Next slide. Um, and so here, I think um, we see both the truck loading, um, but also the accessoride stop. So maintaining the accessoride stop um, and um, some of the truck loading to make sure that we're accommodating those um, delivery needs. Um, sorry, that is a cat um, that you can't see. Next slide. <laughs> Um, and then again, maintaining access to all of the adjacent um, loading docks um, and maintaining vehicular access to the block. Next slide. Um, and so what does this actually feel like, right? So this is the toolkit that we were just walking through. So this is the shared street on Willoughby um, where, the where the partnership um, maintains. Um, and so you can see our standard shared street toolkit is movable furniture, planters, um, epoxy gravel, both in the road roadway in one color and in the pedestrian space in another, um, bike parking, flexible delineators, and all of our standard markings. Um, next slide. 
And so again, a different a different shot of Willoughby, um, the same the same pedestrian expansion from a different angle. Um, but you can see how a shared street accommodates loading needs while slowing traffic um, and prioritizes pedestrian and cyclists um, so that they were sort of rebalancing the street to meet the needs. Next slide. And then another, this is closer to what it would feel like on, um, on that Livingston to Skirmerhorn block of white where we've worked in a true chicane. Um, and again, really um, slowing traffic through that turn um, while maintaining um, necessary vehicular access um, and prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists. Next slide. And so looking at next steps, um, so we're here tonight to present to you guys. Um, in the next month or so, we'll be coordinating the final design details um, with and scheduling and notification. Um, we're aiming to start implementation mid-June. Um, we expect that it will go through the fall. Um, and then in, you know, we in the public space unit always, um, we don't sort of put things on the ground and walk away. We always come back um, and evaluate and survey and make sure things are working um, as we intended. Um, and then 2023 and beyond, you know, future public space improvements. Um, so with that, I will open it up to questions. I'd like to go to the questions first with the uh, committee members, please. And Taya, can you handle that? I don't see all the names of the stuff. Danny, by. Raise your hand, please, in the window so we can call your name. The first committee members. I see Ms. Blount. I just want to clarify some, something. I think I heard it at another presentation before. You're not going to remove the buses from Fulton Street, are you? No. Okay. Thank you. That's not part of this project. I'm not part of a project I know of. Sorry. Okay. I don't, thank think, you. I don't think it's part of any project, but that's what's. <laughs> Next is John Dew. Uh, good evening. I have a number of issues that I want to raise. Um, first of all, uh, this is extremely extensive. When you did the John, you're cutting it in half. We can't, we can't hear your question. John, turn off your video. Maybe that'll help the. Uh, maybe that'll help the uh, quite your uh, vo your voice. This is the same problem I had yesterday. I know. Maybe. I'm sorry. Yes, that's better now. Maybe that's Apple. Um, I don't see any numbers attached to either the projects or the uh, uh, assessments of the pedestrian or bike traffic or bus or truck traffic. Is that information also available? Um, in this plan, is there any removal of parking for cars? No, John, why don't you do one question at a time so you can get answers and then we can We'll, we'll, oh, we'll, okay, I didn't know. I, I thought I should get. I'll, them let, I'll let you. I'll let you go back to your second question. But there are okay. other people asking too. So let's 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 see if we can get an answer to John's first question, please. Um, so yes, we can uh, share what data we have um, with the committee. Um, we do like fairly regular counts in the area as well, so we have some extensive data. And then to the parking question. Um, May, would you mind going back to some of the slides? Sure. One second. Yeah. Um, we are removing some parking for cars. It is primarily um, metered parking. Um, I will say, I think, you know, in talking to our parking group, um, their, uh, their data shows that it is not used for metered parking primarily, but for um, placard parking primarily. Um, and so that is, the bulk of that is on bridge. Well, the, 
problem with that is that that's a problem throughout the, the community and there is no enforcement. Yes, understood. Okay, so that issue remains. Um, my next issue John, John, is- John, we're gonna yes. have other people ask other questions first. We'll come back to you, I promise. Who else wants to ask a question? I see Ernie next. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I haven't been reining in on this redesign. I just have a basic question. Uh, what's the end purpose? What's the goal of this redesigning of, um, of these streets? Uh, downtown Brooklyn is not exactly a 24-7 destination. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I just look at the ebb and flow in New York City. Uh, it seems like I, I know because I've been here all my life that that New York is always tend to be going to a to a destination. They're in a hurry to get from point A to point B for some activity or for some or work or whatever. But they're you know they're they're always on the go. Even uh, you have Frank's um, football uh, Frank uh, fo Frank stand. You know, my own habit is that I grab a Frank and I'm gone. I'm eating it and getting on the bus or going to the subway or, or whatever. And, uh, but people aren't, is, are people there after 5 p.m. At, uh, in the evening? Is that 24-7? That's why um, we're doing this? Yeah, so I mean, I think I can speak to DOT's goals. I think um, our goals here are to rebalance the roadway to meet current needs, right? So we just see way more pedestrians and way more cyclists in this area than we do cars. And so we want to prioritize that mode of transportation. Um, you know, at, at our heart, we are a transportation agency, right? So um, making sure that the infrastructure meets current needs. Um, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, all right. I, right. I, Next yeah. person, please. Okay. Thank you, Ernie. Next person. It's Julia Collinchung. Uh, hey, thank you. Um, I think this is great. I'm a supporter of it. Um, I have two kids at the Brooklyn Prospect School. Um, I did want to um, address like that uh, intersection, Willoughby and Bridge, if you could pull it up. Um, Jessica, you had mentioned that there was um, going to be a loading area, um, a pickup area rather. Um, at that in, at that location. Um, so yeah, if you go back one, there's um, that that the 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 school is right on that corner. Um, okay. There there are a line of parents and a school bus, uh, school buses rather, a series of school buses that drop kids off on Bridge Street um, because there are two schools actually in that one uh, building. Um, one of the schools enters on Bridge Street and the other one enters on Willoughby Street. Um, there the way that the school works is that you have to wait with your child. You can't just like, you know, drop them off of the car and they run and you have to wait in line with your child until they walk in. So there are a lot of cars that are double parked along Bridge Street right around uh, uh, th that corner. So it doesn't look like, and there's school buses that stop and will block traffic. It doesn't look like there's a pullover zone or a pickup zone. Um, allocated uh, for parents and or school buses to be able to uh, drop off and pick up. So I would just suggest that, you know, maybe looking at that to just allow like a pullover zone or a pickup zone instead of just a single lane. Um, yeah, that's there. a really good suggestion. I will say that there is a school bus loading zone on Willoughby. There's two school buses. There's two entrances. There's one school bus that stops in Willoughby. There's another school bus that stops on um a bridge because there are two schools within that building. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the um, the thing the when we talked the, to the school about it, they were excited about having um, the the pedestrian space with seating for parents great. to wade in. Um, yeah. That is so, great. Yeah. It's a it's a balancing act always. Um, but so we'll maybe look. it's that other bump out a little bit further down that may get like could you look at shortening or or um, yeah, you know, maybe just allowing some more pullover space. Yes, I think that's something we can work on. I will also add that just because, I mean, currently it's um, right in front of the school, it's signed as actually um, no parking just because of the, um, 
the loading dock um, right above that mid block space, right? So in order for um, cars to back out, they need a little bit of space. So um, we can also look to incorporate more sort of loading space with high turnover here. Great. Um, and then the other thing I would suggest is, um, is, is actually a request for DOT. Once you get into Willoughby, and say so you want to get out of downtown Brooklyn, you, you, you get into Willoughby and now you're at Willie, Willoughby and Bridge, no longer can you take the right at J because you're not, you, you know, only buses now can take the right at J to get out to downtown Brooklyn. Um, you can't take a right at um, Lawrence Street to get out of downtown Brooklyn because you will only be able to get out of downtown Brooklyn by going through uh, where the parking area is. Um, in sort of like underneath Metro Tech, which is illegal. It's for local traffic only. It's only for like, you know, parkers and buses. So the only way to get out of downtown Brooklyn is to take Bridge Street, take a left on Bridge Street, um, or to go all the way down to J Street and take a, a left on J Street instead of going right. So, and then once you take a left on Bridge Street, you can't go down Fulton because you have to go down to Hoyt Street to Livingston to get out of downtown Brooklyn. So, so I would suggest once you're funneled um, down to Bridge Street, maybe consider allowing car traffic down Fulton Mall for an extra block. Instead of funneling all the traffic down to Hoyt Street, allow traffic down to Albee Square, um, where traffic already goes anyway behind the, behind the, um, the Target and the City Point building, um, allow them to go one extra block to be able to, to get out of downtown Brooklyn, make, make the left, left-hand turn from Fulton to Albee. Um, that's just something that will prevent traffic down, unnecessary traffic on Hort Street. Since you wanna make it a shared street, you wanna make, pedestrianize it. Let's get rid of the cars that are only going down Hoyt Street because they can't go down Fulton Mall. So that's a, that's a recommendation as well. And I have a question on the where it shows Fleet Street. That, that Fleet Street's not open to traffic, is it? The one that's down by Flatbush, that Fleet Street's not open to traffic. Um, you're right. No, um, no, that uh, that is part of well, mostly part of um, I'll be whatever sorry. it is. It's not open to traffic. Right. Yes. Correct. Uh, Sid. Yes. So um, the question about buses uh, not traveling on Fulton Street, and the answer was, I believe, uh, the buses are going to stay on Fulton. I, I remember being told that um, buses were going to be uh, taken from Fulton. I don't know what eastbound. No, or no, no, that's that's a that. I, there's no at, at right now, other than that. There's a there is a redesign by the MTA on the bus traffic. Fulton Street remains as a bus only route, uh, and has not changed. There's no request to remove it. There's no request to change it. I don't want to speak for the MTA or for anybody else. But that is not changing. When we talk about Skirmahorn in a few minutes, we can discuss that as well. But at this point, no buses are being removed from either Livingston or Fulton, Fulton Mall. And that uh, you can be sure that that's something when they do the redesign of the bus route, they will continue to use those because they need them, frankly. Great. Thank you for that definitive clarification, Sid. Um, next up, I see Nicole Murray. Uh, yep, apologies if I, I missed this, but um, in terms of the metered parking that is currently being used as a placard parking, so placard abuse is a problem because it's an abuse of a placard. They, It's not legal, but they do it anyway. It, what is being done to prevent that from happening, happening again? Are there physical barriers or other impediments to people just using it as placard parking? Um, so in the pedestrian spaces, um, there will be planters and granite blocks demarcating the edges so that they won't be accessible to vehicles. Um, but the, the metered parking that is remaining um, will remain as it, as it is. Um, I think we as an agency are, are looking for ways to solve the Placard abuse. Um, I know our parking unit cares very much about that. So I don't think we're allowed to shoot them. Mr. Chair, this is being recorded. I don't <laughs> see 
I don't see any other committee members' hands raised. Are there any other committee members? Can get the general yeah. public now, please. Uh, wait a minute. I have one question about the permit parking. Okay. Um, if you if you don't allow them in one place, they're going to go to another place, and there's no enforcement. Everybody knows that. So, um, but you know, putting planters to stop them from going in one place, they're going to come somewhere else. So it's moving them around. How did that happen? I would like to say something about the buses, because I know I'm not crazy, because Sandy, I know it was said at another presentation that yeah. they was going to have the buses go one way on Fulton Street and another way on Livingston. Right, but that was yeah. years ago. That no, was years ago. No, was, wait a minute, oh, Sid. Man, right ahead. I want to know if that is still in the plans. That's an MTA issue. It's not an issue for DOT. It's not being discussed, and they wouldn't have any knowledge of it. It was part when they when it was presented. It was part of the downtown Brooklyn shared streets. And it was um, Sandy is shaking her head too. I'm not was, the only one that remembers it. It was withdrawn. Okay. All right. So if it comes up against it, I'm going to remind you that you said it was withdrawn. withdrawn. Be, okay. Be my guest. Sid. Thanks, Chair Blount. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sid. Sid, yes. Uh, before you get to the public questions, I did not complete my questions. Go ahead, go ahead uh, uh, John. Um, I didn't see any addressing of the public transportation network for downtown Brooklyn. Has the partnership discussed uh, putting countdown clock at all of the bus stops? Is there any discussion of the ADA access to the subway stations, which is pretty deplorable for downtown Brooklyn? We have many st stations that are not ADA compliant with elevator access, and we have some stations where the, where the elevator access is uh, inappropriate. Is that part of what the partnership is looking at? Uh, John, we are not currently looking at MTA ADA accessibility um, beyond supporting it as much as we possibly can. Um, but that is not part of this plan, nor do we govern that either. Well, uh, the, the funding for this, is there any city funding that's going into this project? Yeah, and I, I feel like I should just clarify very quickly. I am from the DOT. I work in the Department of Transportation Public Space Unit. So we are working in partnership with the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Sorry, that's a lot of partnerships. Um, but um, so, and we are working on the shared streets portion uh, because we share some of those goals. Um, and so there is city funding. It's part of our annual SIP program, our street improvement program. So it's all expense funding. Um, and so um, we can, we can um, if you are concerned about the cost, we can um, put together a rough budget for the project for the DOT portion for you. Um, and we can and also when you talk about parking spots yep. and, and, and pedestrian activity, can you provide numbers that justify all of the uh, pedestrian and, and parking improvements. And I'd also like to understand, understand how deliveries and the permit parkers are supposed to be accommodated because in 2004, the city agreed to create an underground parking spot on Duffield Street under the park to accommodate all of the excess parking downtown Brooklyn. And that parking was eliminated but there was no plan to replace it anywhere. So removing items and stuff and cars and the like sounds good, but where do those folk go when they have to come downtown Brooklyn? I would like to get a better feel for how that is being accommodated. You can't just get rid of the placard parking. When the folks have placards, they're gonna come downtown, do they belong to agencies? We need to study more 
what the impact of placard parking is and are we talking about getting rid of placard parking as opposed to getting rid of placard parking spaces? Priscilla Franklin's asking a question. Go ahead, Priscilla. I don't think there's an answer to you what you've asked, John. I, mean, I just have a, a quick question, a comment. You're doing like, I don't have a problem with all the improvements, but we're doing all the improvements with the pedestrian walking and making wider spaces. Are they bringing any like attractions to downtown? Like, because after five, there's really not that much to do down there. And as shopping wise for like stores, there's really not that many like stores, eateries, or different things for people to do downtown. So are they looking partner with someone to improve the whole downtown look? Um, well, I can let um, Belinda may talk to programming um, and activations because I know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of our main missions is to attract, uh, you know, after hours businesses. Uh, create a 24 seven neighborhood, um, bring in attractions. It's something we work hard to do. We can't just do it on our own. You know, we, that's not the mission and that's not what the money that we're funded with is meant to do. Um, I would say there's a lot of new stuff coming in and on the horizon. Uh, and also with all of the residential construction and additions of units, uh, it is, there are far more people just there all the time. Um, but you are correct. We we need more stuff to do in downtown Brooklyn, and and we're trying to make that happen as to the best of our abilities. Right, and I would just like to add that, you know, for us att attracting um, restaurants, full service restaurants that are open later in the evenings as well is um, one of the goals. In the last two or three years, there have been a number that have opened, and I'm sure you guys have also been. Um, are aware of the Ace Hotel opening on Stanmore, which is um, has attracted a lot of foot traffic uh, for non-hotel guests and a lot of amenities for the neighborhood, both early in the morning um, in terms of co-working, coffee, seating, everything else, to later in the evening as well. Um, our goal with the shared streets is not just to have tables and chairs out there 24-7. We will maintain the furniture and we'll also put that away in the evening when it's not being used. In addition, we want to make sure the spaces are vibrant and thus, you know, we're working with DOT on the art program and selecting an artist um, who will make the space look brighter, more colorful and, and feel more safe, um, as well as adding in and uh, maintaining per perennial plantings and street trees in the planters. So we have a more softer uh, streetscape. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's if there's a no stores down there, like um, oh, why oh, are oh, people oh. going down? Like if it's nothing down there. Okay, so there's a Zoom user who wants to talk, who's had her hand up, but whose name I don't know. Miss, do you still want to talk? All right, go ahead, Ernie. Okay. Um, several years ago, a former member, uh, Lawrence Whiteside, he made an observation uh, after a developer was in a building, I guess, the engineering school for uh, uh, Brooklyn Poly Prep. And he talked about the Metro Tech common space and how it was going to be actively used uh, by the students and the grad students and be hanging out. And Lawrence sort of cut him off and said, are you kidding me? They're all going to be up in Fort Greene or in Williamsburg. You know, uh, Metro Tech Commons was a dead zone, you know. And I, I, I see that observation. I see all this street redesign. And I, I don't see the users and what's the end goal? It's going to have 24-7. Uh, uh, they get 24-7 on uh, in, uh, no, in uh, no, uh, Fulton or Fowler Plaza up here in Fort Greene and over in Williamsburg. Uh, I'm just uh, floored by that. You know, there's no entertainment. Uh, there's no bars. Uh, there's... There are bars, I don't, I don't and we have it. Alamo, so we entertainment is still Alamo. coming. Um, and you know, we want to make sure that our streets are still safe and are improved in every neighborhood. Oh, I'm going to be quiet, but it's not organic. I guess that's the reason I'm saying it. It's mm -hmm. not organic. It come from the 
activity, movement, the body. You know, uh, you know, we have urban kids who do not hang out in mall. They're not mall rats. They always have destinations. So I just don't want to, you know, that's downtown partnership. I'll leave it alone, but I just don't, I just don't understand it. Thank you, Ernie. I think, Lucy, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, first of all, last time Downtown Brooklyn Partnership was here, they definitely said that they were looking into making Fulton one way for buses, and then I always get uh, Livingston the other direction. And I am curious, they, if I put in the chat, I've been taking that bus recently. It takes all of three to six minutes from uh, Flatbush to Court Street and then Borum to Flatbush in the other direction. I can't it makes no sense to to change that. So it was definitely said they were looking at it at least. But my question I put in the chat was, how much does this all cost? Who's paying for it? Are all the taxpayers, we're all paying for these massive million, multi-million dollar changes. Um, and as I said, I don't understand the priorities with whatever, something like 80,000 homeless people, many homeless families, every extra penny it seems to me should be in providing housing and shelter for people who are unhoused and people are getting evicted left and right and people are moving out of the city because they can't afford okay, it. Lucy, okay. I don't, under, I'm right. not finished. Okay. I don't understand okay. the Hold for money. A minute. Let what? someone answer the question. How much yeah, is I don't understand gonna, the money. How much is it going to cost and who's paying? So for I think Jessica already spoke to that. She said that she would get numbers to follow up. Uh, yeah. Lucy, we and the DOT are our money can't be spent on homeless, housing the homeless. That's not how it works. Well, it's not DOT, it's city money. They're, they're, they'll, it's they'll city find, money. It's, find, well, well, it's, find, well, um, hold sorry. on, hold on, stop. What? <laughs> we'll find out how much it's going to cost and I'll come back with that information. Right, but I'm saying- We're not, we're not going to, excuse me, we're not solving the homeless problem at this point right now. We're going to move on. Anybody else has a question? I'm saying the priorities are yeah, Lucy, up. Lucy, move on. Lucy, Lucy, you should go to the budget, the city budget hearings and tell them to allocate more money to the Department of Homeless Shelter stuff, right? So the money has to come from money. somewhere. Okay. Sid, you got to allow conversation. Uh, no, excuse me. No, I don't have to allow cause conversation. Why? Because right? that's, that's not the way this works. Okay. Daryl, you're next. Daryl. Yes, uh, good evening. I, I want to talk about the um the Gates Avenue project. Is this the time to do it or should no, I do it? No, we'll do that when we get to the oh, okay. uh, 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 community forum. Thank you, Daryl. Okay. If there be no further questions, uh, Rosalind, you have something to say? Rosalind? You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you until you unmute. Rosalind? Just give her a second, Sid. I'm going to give her a second. I just said to unmute. There has to be on the board, there's a normally on the bottom bar, there's a things you have to spot and press unmute. Rosalind, if you're on a computer, hold down your space bar while you're talking. Rosalind, we're going to have to move on to someone else. I'm sorry. Feel free to chat it in the... Well, you put it in the chat. And does anybody else want to comment on this before we move on to the next? The uh, uh, Sid, Sid, it's John. I, 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 procedurally, is the is DOT, the partnership, asking us to do anything? Or is this just a presentation? This is informational only tonight, correct? Yes, that's what that I... correct, yes. Okay. I, mean, what, I think it looks nice. That, I mean, you, you have a schedule to do implementation. Does that mean what we see is what we're going to get? Um, we're still finalizing the, the details, um, but largely the broad strokes, yes. Then then I would suggest, I, I, have, no, I have no objection to it, but I think in light of that, since it's not going to be put to the committee or to the board for any kind of a vote. Anybody who wants to has any, uh, we already had Juliet's, we've had certain specific things, but I think any other specific items should be presented if anybody has any. I am finally unmuted. Oh, yay. <laughs> it was blocked. Yay. Okay, yeah. I, 
may I comment? I'm sorry. Yes, please, please uh, go, I please. just I just want to comment uh, um, on what Ernest was um, talking about. That these changes, although downtowns certainly need whole need improvement, but these changes appear to be being made for situations that don't exist. I know that all of the images of the sidewalks and those efforts to make them to accommodate all of the pedestrians, well, the sidewalks were empty on almost all of those images. And I, I don't think that was done purposely. I think that's what exists. And the restaurants that aren't there and, uh, and the, the residents that aren't there and the entertainment that isn't there and what it appears, the only thing I can figure out is that there are going to be thousands and thousands of new units built, re residential units uh, in the high rises. And could this be being done for, to make their units more, more valuable? I, I just don't understand why all of this is being done at once to accommodate needs that don't exist. I, I, anyway, thank you. <laughs> Oh, have I been unmuted? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, anything else that uh, it, that should be any motion to be made? Anything else? Okay, hearing well, that. John, you have something is, else? This is John Do. Yes, I, I based on. John, we're still having the, the same problem with you anyway. The committee. And from John, John, if we, John, if we have John, you got it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Try now, John. Okay, ba based on the comments that have come from the committee, including myself and from the public, I think we need to develop some kind of position on what was presented tonight. Uh, I don't understand the funding, I don't understand how much DOT has committed to this particular project versus everything else that is going on in our district where we don't have uh, uh, addressing the issue. I think we need to be a lot more aggressive and make some kind of statement regarding the concerns and the information that DOT has promised uh, this committee. We didn't get any numbers. I said that earlier. I'm saying it again, because that is important. A project of this magnitude must come with figures and numbers. How much is it gonna cost? What pedestrians are we are looking to accommodate? I agree with Roz's comment that none of the pictures showed any congestion. You can't present a problem that doesn't exist and present funding for an issue that doesn't exist. So. We have to get numbers before uh, we can actually say that this is something that's a value to community district too. Thank you. Okay, so I will encourage everyone who has comments that if they, they have felt have not been heard to write to the community board about it so that we can uh, discuss it with the uh, DOT if necessary or with the, uh, and we would ask that the DOT uh, give us the amount of funding this is gonna cost and who is paying for it. Yeah, no problem. I can get that to you after the meeting and then we can discuss further. Thank you. We can move on. The next thing on the agenda is Skirmhorn Vision Zero SIP. Great, this is Keith Bray from DLT. Thank you, Sid, and the committee for uh, being here tonight. Uh, this is a project was a, a matter of concern for the community for a while. And we've heard from many people about the operation of Skimmerhorn Street from all users. And so tonight we're going to give a presentation for what we think is a good solution to the words that, and uh, issues that we have come to our attention and also from things that have been brought to our attention from the public. Uh, and just to quickly answer a question before, we are not asking for a vote for this project right now. We are hoping to get the board's feedback and obviously we'll take the board's advisory opinion of anything they have or any feedback and questions. And of course we will take that 
into consideration and then we do as we do with all DLT projects. With that, uh, you know, Emily Sarah here, we'll turn over to the project. Uh, Alicia Posner, Ben Schwed, whoever is gonna give the presentation, please move forward. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Posner. I'm the Deputy Director of Safety Projects and Programs here at DOT. Um, and our unit focuses on Vision Zero safety projects um, with an emphasis on traffic calming improvements and complete street treatments. Um, and I'm here with my uh, colleague, Ben Schwade, who's going to be giving the presentation. Just a brief disclaimer that uh, somebody came over the intercom, we're in our office saying that they were testing the fire alarm system. So if that should happen, um, you'll hear that and we'll mute ourselves and pause the presentation uh, until that has stopped. So um, it'll be exciting to see if that happens. Um, so with that, um, Ben, take, you can take it away. Great, thanks Felicia, thanks Keith, and thanks to the community board for having us. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll walk you through um, our presentation for Skimmerhorn Street tonight. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Great, thank you. All right, so um, today we're gonna be uh, talking to you about a proposal that we have for uh, Skimmerhorn Street in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, looking at the extent of the street, which runs between Clinton Street and Third Avenue. Um, as you know, this is in downtown Brooklyn, kind of the southern part of downtown Brooklyn, uh, part of the Court Livingston Skimmerhorn Business Improvement District, um, as well as the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Um, and just some brief context for starting Skimmerhorn Street is a, one of the, is a east-west street through Brooklyn. Um, it's a local truck route between Flatbush Avenue and Smith Street. Um, and currently it is a two-way street from Smith Street to Third Avenue and a one-way street westbound between Smith Street and Clinton Street. Um, and on both, on the whole thing has standard bike lanes um, with the directions of the street. So standard two-way bike lanes where the street is two ways between Smith and Third and, and one-way westbound bike lanes between Smith and Clinton. So a, a background about the project tonight um, and why we're here to look at talking about Skimmerhorn. Um, Skimmerhorn is located within a Vision Zero priority area that generally encompasses downtown Brooklyn um, due to the high number of pedestrians who have been severely injured in the, in the limits. Um, on the eastern edge, Skimmerhorn, Third Avenue, and Flatbush is a Vision Zero priority intersection. Um, which has had a specifically high number of pedestrians severely injured. There's a long history of community requests for safety improvements along Skimmerhorn Street. We've gotten many of them from the public, um, as well as from both former council member Levin and the current council member Ressler. Um, a lot of people have requested up improvements to safety, to the road conditions, um, and regarding the blocked travel and bike lanes on the street frequently. Um, this is to note just some of the work that is going on within downtown Brooklyn. Um, when we look at it, when we talk about tonight's proposal for Skinnerhorn Street, um, it's part of the city's commitment to improving the street network throughout downtown Brooklyn. Um, and this map just quickly shows in some of the recent and future uh, things that DOT is looking at um, or has done. In blue, you see recent work called out. So some the shared streets that Jessica was walking you through earlier tonight. Uh, the Tillery Street Capital improvements, the bike and busway on J Street, as well as Smith Street, and the Brooklyn Bridge protected bike lane, to name a few examples. And just to, and in addition to what we're going to talk about on Skimmerhorn tonight, other DOT is also, as you just heard, looking to expand the shared street network. Uh, DOT is looking at transit improvements throughout the neighborhood, um, planning capital improvements to build out safety improvements, as well as looking at additional opportunities to improve the streetscape throughout the neighborhood. So talking about Skirmerhorn, um, our team is really focused here on kind of on crash reduction and injury reduction. Um, and we see that Skirmerhorn Street, unfortunately, has a large, a long and troubling history of injuries occurring on it. It's a fairly short street, and on the length of it, in the most recent five-year period that we have our standard data from, there have been more than 150 people injured along Skimmerhorn. 
Of those 150 people, four people um, either suffered a severe injury or a fatality. There was one fatality um, and three people who were severely injured um, along Skimmerhorn Street. Um, and concerningly, in the data that we're in the historic crash data, we've seen a rise in, in, in injuries along Skimmerhorn Street that you can see in the bottom left, um, where we've seen injuries growing year over year. And that's really a trend that's alarming to us and one that we want to look to reverse and kind of bring those injuries on Skimmerhorn down. So in addition to the numbers, we look at how people are getting injured on the street. And we see kind of breaking it down by the road users. We see that people in cars, people driving or passengers are getting injured more so because of the breakdown in roadway function because Skimmerhorn Street as it is now does not work well. It's a congested, fairly narrow street um, with lots of double parking, lots of blockages. And we see that compared to averages across Brooklyn, more people are injured by side swipes and rear end collisions on Skimmerhorn than a, across the borough. Um, as people driving cars have to deal with narrow passing lanes um, or narrow going by double parked vehicles, um, stopping unexpectedly to deal with uh, a car coming across the double yellow line to get over around a double part vehicle. And this kind of breakdown in roadway function and congestion is what causes more of these injuries on Skirmerhorn, as opposed to crashes that are more indicative of really fast speeding. There are less right angle crashes on Skimmerhorn, which we see more typically when streets have speeding and people running red lights and driving recklessly. We see that a lot of the vehicles are getting, people in vehicles are getting injured because of the breakdown and how the roadway works. When we look at how pedestrians are getting injured on Skimmerhorn, um, we see that the majority of pedestrians are injured while crossing at the intersection with the signal in the crosswalk doing the exact right thing. And of those pedestrians, the vast majority of those pedestrians are injured by uh, left turning drivers. So vehicles making left turns off of Skimmerhorn um, into the crosswalk. They're looking for a break in traffic and they don't look for pedestrians in the crosswalk. And tragically, that's been the most frequent cause of our pedestrian injuries. Um, we also see that as there's been more and more development on Skimmerhorn Street, there are more injured, more pedestrians around, more unfortunately, more opportunities for conflict between vehicles and pedestrians. We also see that on this corridor, injuries are highest during the midday and the PM rush hour, kind of in the afternoon and commuting and, and evening commuting times. When we look at, we know that Skimmerhorn Street is a really uh, Can I ask anyone uh, to please mute themselves if you're, uh, if you're not speaking now? Thank you. Um, we know that uh, there are... <laughs> Sorry. We know that there are a lot of cyclists on Skimmerhorn who are also unfortunately being injured on this street. We see uh, approximately in from late 2019, we saw approximately 1,200 cyclists. Who cares? Can you please mute yourself? Um, we see about 1,200 cyclists riding daily on Skimmerhorn Street with two to 300 cyclists regularly counted during the rush hours. The bike lanes frequently blocked by double parked vehicles, which forces cyclists to go around them unsafely into the roadway, causing these conflicts with vehicles. We see that cyclists are frequently injured by, most frequently injured by turning vehicles um, as they have to navigate the same space, the same tight spaces, deal with, go around the same double parked cars. Um, and we see cyclists are often injured uh, by turning vehicles when they're not visible and not in predictable locations to drivers. We also see a lot of cyclists injured by side swipe and rear end crashes um, as they have to deal with the same challenges of double parking and unexpected uh, stopping uh, and starting uh, that vehicles do. And so we just, I'd like to point to the quote in the top right of the screen um, looks that we, our, our outreach teams got when they did their surveys of the street. Um, which says this street desperately needs protected or separated bike lanes. Cars are always in the bike lane double part or otherwise blocking the bike lane. And so that was kind of indicative of a lot of the feedback that we got. Skimmerhorn Street is, question? we're gonna hold all questions to the end, please. Um, Skimmerhorn Street, 
um, the existing bike lanes on Skinnerhorn Street are one of, are a really crucial east-west connection throughout downtown Brooklyn. Um, Skimmerhorn Street connects uh, to the bridges, to the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges, as well as to downtown Brooklyn, and connects to some of the most heavily used bike lanes in Brooklyn um, to provide, and it's one of the most important links in the cycling network. To the south, uh, Skimmerhorn connects to Hoyt and Bond Street, um, going to other neighborhoods, and to the east, uh, Skimmerhorn continues on Lafayette Ave, or cyclists can come in uh, via DeKalb Avenue. Um, there are also additional bike lanes, such as Borum Place leading up to the Brooklyn Bridge um, on, on Clinton Street as well. Um, so it's a really crucial east-west link um, with really heavy cyclist volumes um, that were taken in October of 2019. We've seen in, since the start of the COVID pandemic that, that cycling numbers have only increased in the city uh, since then. And so we would imagine that the numbers that we have on Skimmerhorn have also similarly increased. So in looking in addition to the crashes, we look to try to understand how the street is being used. Um, and we see that it's a really dense residential and commercial activity on the street. Um, and so that means that for vehicles on Skimmerhorn, there's a lot of parking. Um, there's a lot of double parking for deliveries and unloading. Uh, there's illegal back-end parking that you can see in this photo. Um, there's frequent truck loading. There's lot, there are now, there are multiple hotels on this stretch. So hotels are loading and unloading passengers and their goods. And so that results in the, the streets frequently being blocked. The travel lanes blo are blocked, the bike lanes are blocked. And that mean, leads to an unpredictable street and congestion. So it both means that vehicles going on Skirmerhorn frequently have to go, go around double parked trucks into oncoming traffic. And that means you have to wait for a vehicle going the other way. It means there are more conflicts and it means that traveling on the street is slow and unsafe. We see that it's also for pedestrians, it's a transit and a pedestrian hub. Um, the Hoyt Skimmerhorn station on the A, C and G train is on this portion of Skimmerhorn, um, as well as adjacent uh, train stations uh, and heavy bus usages on nearby streets. Um, and we also see their near destinations on Skimmerhorn their hotels, their uh, Chelsea Piers, their new resident, there's lots of residential buildings, their uh, city agencies. And so all of these kind of really bring a lot of pedestrians to Skimmerhorn Street. And then like I was discussing before, it's also a key cyclist uh, connector. It's a really busy street for cyclists in Brooklyn, um, one of the key connections in the borough. And we see that there are lots of cyclists on this street competing for the limited space that we have on a crowded corridor. So in addition to our observations, um, we want to understand Skimmerhorn Street from the people who know it best. And that's those who live, work, and, experience, and use Skimmerhorn regularly. And so last year, our street ambassador team, which is our in-house outreach team, um, went, to, went to the businesses on Skimmerhorn to survey as many as we could talk to about their loading and their delivery practices um, and needs as well as their kind of observations about how the street functions. The most typical, the most uh, frequently uh, mentioned thing with deliveries um, was that about 70% of the businesses said that when vehicles make deliveries to them, they typically double park to make their local deliveries, which lines up with what we see on the street. We see a lot of double parking causing this congestion. Um, and we also see a higher than average frequency of deliveries observed during the midday and the afternoon hours and so kind of contributing to the fact that Skimmerhorn is the most, is at its most congested in those times. Our street ambassador team also surveyed the, the public as well as uh, in addition to the businesses. And this was done both on street, as you can see here, as well as online. Um, our, our street ambassador team spoke to about 260 people over a couple of days in the fall and more than a thousand people completed the same survey um, online to talk to us about street usage, safety, and their and mobility on Skimmerhorn. When we got feedback from people, we found that only 7% of people who have said they rode their bikes on the street and only 32% of people who walk on Skimmerhorn said that they felt either somewhat safe or very safe when they were biking or walking. <coughs> and that number is kind of shockingly low for a street like Skimmerhorn that's a neighborhood street 
And that's really one of the things that we want to make sure we're do, dealing with um, with this proposal is to make sure that people on the street feel safe when they're using their neighborhood streets. The most frequently identified issues that people talked about were double parking blocking both the moving lane and the bike lane um, and the sidewalk and illegal parking blocking the sidewalk. <coughs> um, the largest concerns that people ish, that people talked about were uh, the conditions of the bike lane and said that they were concerned with traffic safety. Um, and people and cyclists and pedestrians both identified illegal parking, um, unpredictable and unsafe driving as their top concerns. And those who drove on Skimmerhorn Street also, at, also said congestion was one of their top concerns for the corridor. So in looking at the conditions on Skimmerhorn and trying to figure out what we could do to improve it, make it a safer street, make it work better for everybody, we see that in its current conditions, we're pretty limited in with respect to the types of treatments that we can pursue. Skimmerhorn Street is a 50 foot wide two way street. It's fairly narrow. Um, and at many intersections, there are existing concrete curb extensions. Those concrete curb extensions are great for pedestrian safety, for shortening crossing distances, but it means that the road gets as narrow as 26 feet wide at its narrowest point which is not enough width for travel lanes in both directions and even our standard bike lanes. So the street gets really narrow. We're and also looking at kind of how we can make the street safer. We see that the kind of adjacent streets that run parallel to Skimmerhorn uh, are really limited in what we can do to provide this kind of transformational safety improvement on Skimmerhorn Street. So to the north, Fulton and Livingston Street are both two-way bus lane corridors. We don't want to have, we don't want to impact the buses with, to, with the, what we're doing on Skimmerhorn Street. To the south, State Street is a narrow residential street. And then again, Atlantic, and then Atlantic Avenue is Atlantic Avenue. And we don't want to be, and we're trying to make sure we're not impacting either those narrow residential streets or Atlantic Avenue. So with that context, um, our proposal for the corridor is to convert Skimmerhorn Street from a two-way street to a one-way eastbound street for vehicles between Smith Street and Third Avenue, as you can see on the map on the left here. With that conversion for vehicles, we'd be adding a two-way parking protected bike lane to the south curb of Skimmerhorn Street between Borum Place and Third Avenue. So Skimmerhorn Street from Smith Street to Third Avenue would be one-way eastbound for vehicles. And for cyclists between Borum Place and Third Avenue, it would be a two-way protected bike lane. West of Borum Place, we would be switching the existing standard bike lane uh, from the north side of the street to the south side of the street, just to connect it better. And then at many intersections along the corridor, um, we'll be installing painted pedestrian refuge spaces, which will shorten crossing distances um, and make the street safer for pedestrians, drivers, and cyclists. So this is an overview of what this will look like. Um, this is our cross section. Um, and in the top, you can see what Skimmerhorn Street currently looks like. Um, and so it, it, it's, the design is in both directions. There's parking along the sidewalk, your standard bike lane, and then your standard travel lane. And the bottom, you can see what it would look like in our proposed conditions. And this is looking to the east. So this is looking towards Third Avenue and Flatbush. And you can see on the left side or the north side, we'd have a wide parking lane. Um, next to that would be our standard width travel lane. Um, next to that would be a, what we call our floating parking lane. So it'd be a wide parking lane that would be adjacent to this buffer space. And then on the, on the right or on the south curb, you would have your two-way protected by your two-way bike lane that's protected by this line row of parked cars. So, in, con in proposing to convert Skimmerhorn to a one-way street, we really believe that making it a one-way eastbound street um, addresses the causes of the injuries that we see happening on Skimmerhorn Street, as the well as provide, happening. Um, as provides opportunities to also make it a more effective uh, street for everybody. I'm going to I'm gonna ask some, whoever's not speaking to mute themselves right now, please. Thank you. Um, by making Skimmerhorn Street a one-way street, it really improves vehicle predictability 
and eliminates head-on conditions created by the congested two-way street. And what we mean by that is to say, if someone is double parked on Skimmerhorn Street, no longer do you have to go into oncoming traffic uh, to get around them. Uh, you can there's enough room built into this design that you can get by anyone who still does double park, um, but without having to deal with the unpredictability of who goes first and who has the right of way um, that happens on a current two-way street. In addition, due to the nature of the street grid on Skimmer, uh, around Skimmerhorn, um, the one-way conversion removes all of the left turns off of Skimmerhorn Street um, between Smith Street and Third Avenue. And as I mentioned, that's the source, the largest source of pedestrian injuries. So this one-way conversion eliminates that most dangerous movement um, where you have to, so you off of Skimmerhorn Street. The one-way street also improves traffic flow on Skimmerhorn Street because again, you're no longer having to deal with those, uh, those issues of congestion and oncoming traffic. Uh, there can be a more consistent traffic flow along Skimmerhorn Street, reducing congestion. But at the same time, the protected bike lanes make sure that the street doesn't become a wide open street for speeding. Um, they provide this element of traffic calming. They also organize the roadway uh, by giving everyone a dedicated space. Um, as well as improving the cyclist connections through to the bike network and cyclist safety. And then, and then also to mention by making this street a one-way street, we can install leading pedestrian intervals for pedestrians um, and bikes on Skimmerhorn. So that means that if you're walking along Skimmerhorn, you get a green light to walk to cross the street before the vehicles can go, which just means that you get to cross the street before cars are turning. Um, making it safer for pedestrians and cyclists as they go. So the, um, the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk through the proposed design in just a little bit more detail um, so that you can see what it looks like. These are all uh, aerial shots and we're going to start on kind of west um, and move our way east, um, starting at Borum Place. And what I'll just point out on all of these, you'll see the bright green two-way parking protected bike lane on the south curb of Skimmerhorn. So at Borum Place, we're proposing to add a painted median tip extension on the south median, um, which will just provide that refuge space for pedestrians crossing the wider street here. It gives you a safe waiting space, as well as ensures that vehicles uh, making turns onto Borum Place, uh, it makes that angle just to, makes that turn just taken at a little bit of a slower, safer speed. Um, and improves yielding to pedestrians. At the intersection of Borum Place approaching it, we'll be installing some quick curb and the few feet approaching the intersection. And we put quick curb here to make sure that vehicles are not parking illegally in this space because it's crucial that we maintain this clear line of visibility uh, between cyclists and drivers as they approach the intersection. And you can see in the top right, just an image of our quick curb. This is a quickly installed, as the name suggests, bar plastic barrier uh, that just makes it very clear that you're not supposed, you can't drive there or stop your car there. Um, if we move one intersection over to Smith Street, um, again, we'll show, we're showing some quick curb in red here uh, to just help make sure that vehicles turning onto Skirmerhorn are taking those turns just a little bit more slowly at a safer speed, making sure they're yielding to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and making sure that, that visibility, there's that clear visibility, um, as well as showing here a proposed hotel loading zone for the Hilton Hotel. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but all the hotels across the bike lane will have hotel loading zones to make sure that they can, uh, they can pick up and drop off and get deliveries safely and conveniently. If we move over to Hoyt Street, one, the next intersection over, um, you can see at this intersection, we're proposing our painted pedestrian space at the intersections. Um, and these, this pedestrian space uh, does a couple of things. It, one, it shortens the crossing distances of, across Skirmerhorn. So it makes sure that it, when pedestrians cross the street, they have less distance. Uh, it's an easier, shorter, safer crossing. It also ensures that vehicles making the right turns off of Skirmerhorn onto Hoyt Street, take that turn at just, again, a little bit of a slower, safer speed, making sure that they're yielding to pedestrians and cyclists in the bike lane and the crosswalk. On the other side, we have our quick curb again, 
which much like at or in place is here to make sure that vehicles are not parking illegally and that there's this clear uh, line of vision between cyclists and drivers as they approach the intersection. At Bond Street, the design is the same, but just flipped because of the direction of Bond Street. So your painted pedestrian space is on the right or the east side of the intersection, and your quick curb is on the west, is on the left or west side of the intersection here. Nevin Street, once again, moving further to the east has a similar design. So your protected intersection with the painted pedestrian space to shorten your crossing distances and slow your turning vehicles and your quick curb to make sure that there's no illegal parking and that you have this clear visibility. Um, and then to focus on the, the complicated intersection of Third Avenue, Lafayette Avenue, Flatbush Avenue, um, a couple of things to note. Uh, this slip lane here is currently closed, is already closed. Uh, because we will no longer have westbound vehicles on Skirmerhorn Street, we're proposing to just expand it a little bit more uh, to give more space to pedestrians at this busy intersection and again shorten your crossing distances of Skirmerhorn. For cyclists continuing eastbound onto Lafayette Avenue, we're looking to adjust how this crossover works for eastbound cyclists by giving them a dedicated signal timing here. Um, so that when the vehicles and cyclists are crossing, they're not going at the same time. The cyclists will get a green light for them where they can go and safely get into the, what we call the bike box and the at Flatbush. And then the vehicles can go after the cyclists are clearly established here um, and align themselves accordingly. We're also proposing to add a leading pedestrian interval for pedestrians um, getting, going across Flatbush Avenue. Um, to improve pedestrian safety, give them a head start to cross the street before vehicles can go, uh, making those making the crossings of the long Flatbush Avenue safer for pedestrians. Um, and then just to note, the work that we're doing this year will be in paint, um, but there's a planned capital project as well as private developments um, to be building out these painted spaces um, and adding additional curb extensions and refuges on the, at this intersection, a uh, plan for a few, a few years from now. So just a couple of uh, final uh, closing thoughts. Um, when we talk about protected bike lanes in New York City, um, one of the things that's really important that we really wanna stress is that protected bike lanes um, increase safety for everybody on the street. Um, a lot of times they're thought of as, oh, this is just for the cyclists. Um, but the, we see that there are benefits for everybody using the roadway because they organize space on the street. Uh, more. They organize the space better. And everyone has a dedicated space that they're supposed to be in. And there are elements such as our painted pedestrian space that slow down vehicles uh, and make just kind of everything happen in its own where it's supposed to occur reducing the conflicts and making the streets more predictable. DOT has seen that on streets with protected bike lanes, there's a 15% decrease in all crashes with injuries. That includes a 15% decrease in motor vehicle occupant injuries. And the largest decrease is actually to pedestrian injuries, which decreased by more than 20% on streets with protected bike lanes. Injuries to cyclists on protected bike lanes, the risk is lowered dramatically. There's a 3% increase in cyclist injuries on protected bike lanes, but there's also more than a 60% volume increase of cyclists where we've put them in. So the risk of cycling also decreases pretty significantly. Just some, uh, a few other things that we're looking into and, and to mention, um, our street ambassador team surveyed the businesses um, last in the fall and they identified commercial loading zone needs over along the corridor um, and kind of looking to see how we can most effectively regulate the curbside and the parking. Um, there is a small impact of parking. This, this project will repurpose approximately 15 to 20 spots across all of Skimmerhorn Street, um, mainly for those treatments that we mentioned, the pedestrian space, the quick curb for visibility um, at intersections, uh, but also for driveway clearances to make sure that any of the businesses that have driveways, the garages, um, that there's no impacts that vehicles can easily turn in and out. Um, Skimmerhorn Street is a truck route. 
Um, so westbound trucks will be rerouted primarily to Atlantic Avenue, which is also a truck route that will be posting additional signage to make sure that truck drivers are directed to Atlantic Avenue. Um, like I mentioned, there are multiple hotels on Skirmerhorn, uh, three that will be across the bike lane. Um, at those hotels, we'll be putting in our hotel loading zone design. This is a narrower example of what that looks like on a street in Manhattan, um, where you have the small painted space adjacent to the bike lane, just to give people enough room to get in and out of their cars, unload their belongings um, without blocking the bike lane. And then the bike lane narrows um, when their so cyclists slow down when they cross these areas. Um, and then lastly, we know that the roadway condition, as you can see in this bottom photo, uh, Skimmer Horn Street is in pretty bad shape. We're planning to resurface it before we implement this project due to the deteriorating conditions of the roadway. So there'll be a fresh coat of asphalt for everybody who uses Skimmer Horn. Uh, so it'll be a smoother ride, whether you're driving, looking across it with a stroller or a cart, or if you're riding your bike on it. And so just to sum up uh, one final slide, uh, we really believe that this protected bike lane is going to dramatically improve safety and operations and one of the most heavily used bike connections in Brooklyn for the thousands of cyclists currently using it. Um, in addition, the pedestrian space that we're installing reduces crossing distances and creates slower vehicle turns to directly address the cause of the majority of the injuries that are happening on the corridor. Uh, the one-way conversion is going to reduce or eliminate the head-on conflicts um, reduce side swipes and the causes of the vehicle injuries while still preserving the ability to get through the neighborhood, um, but also eliminating the most dangerous movement on this corridor. Um, and then, to, and then the, to note that this project aligns with city and agency-wide goals of expanding the protected bike lane network and providing additional pedestrian space in the city. Um, so with that, thank you all for your attention. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can open it up to any questions that you may have. And we got through that without the fire alarm going off. <laughs> One moment, I am just putting in some new security measures because we've had some high school kids on our line tonight. All right, folks, go ahead and restart your camera, please. Thank you so much. And Sid, are you able to unmute yourself? Mr. Meyer, are you able to unmute yourself? Thank you. You're uh, we will try to get everybody in to make comments as well, but I have a, a couple of points I want to make. First, on Nevin Street on Skirmhorn, on the south corner, there is a Bureau of Child uh, Welfare site that the police drop off children from who are taken from homes. We went through this when there was a proposal to put a bike uh, stand in front of that building. And we got them to move the bike uh, stand, the uh, city bike stand someplace else. So I would ask you again to not make it so that the police can't drop kids who are being removed from homes off at that corner by putting in bollards so the police can't get to that building. It's important for the police to be able to drop off in front without having to bring them around the block, children who are being taken from families. It's a significant, uh, important thing as well. Second of all, in the future, when you, uh, uh, when the DOT goes into the district to send their ambassadors out, I would ask that you notify the community board so that we could also participate to the extent that we can. And if uh, they're doing a, uh, a survey to give it to the community board so the community board would be able to get it out so that we would get as many people as prop possible to respond. And thank you to that. And the, the, that on those points, the next person I see is Chad. 
Mr. Meyer, you have some board members with questions as well. Okay, well, then, then I, I don't, I, uh, well, I don't, I don't see them. I, I, well, Julie, I see Juliet. Why don't you do? And, and, and next it would be Patrick Kalecki. Okay, we'll do Juliet and then Patrick. Juliet, can you unmute Juliet? Oh, Juliet, I'm so there, there you go. go. Thank you, Taya. I was not able to unmute. <laughs> Folks, we had to put an extra layer of security on for tonight, um, so it might take a little while to turn your mic on. No problem. Um, I have a, a two questions. Um, and for background, I am generally supported, supportive of this proposal. I am on the Court Livingston Skirmerhorn Bid Board, as well as community board member uh, uh, Bill Flanoy. Um, through my work, uh, we also own, own a building on Skirmerhorn, so we have retailers uh, that have uh, uh, provided comments as well. Um, generally, uh, none of the comments conflict with anything that you have proposed, so that's a great thing. Um, my, uh, my first question is, one of your um, depictions showed perpendicular street parking on um, Bond Street. And I think that may have been for the, uh, to deal with the, the police parking that always um, block the sidewalk, park perpendicularly, block traffic. Um, you did not explicitly mention the NYPD, but um, I believe uh, Kristen or somebody in the chat did note that it was NYPD Transit Bureau that does this um, uh, illegal parking. I, I would be fine with the legitimization of their parking as long as it is um, able to be accommodated within the, the traffic flow of what you're proposing. So first I would like to understand if, if that is incorporated into your proposal so that we don't have parking on the sidewalk. Um, and then secondly, um, Taya, if you could let me share my screen. Um, I just wanted to dig into your data a little bit because um, I pulled up the uh, New York City crash mapper uh, data um, to try to understand the same, um, let me try to move this so that I can see it, to understand the same uh, study period of 2015 to 2019 that you guys had. And I could not find the same data that you guys were showing. It does not show 56 crashes over here. You know, I, even so I'm, I'm, I'm still supportive of your proposal, but like if you add up all of these like crashes, little ones, twos, threes, fives, ones, there's 10, it just doesn't add up to 150 crashes. So I'm not sure if there's just a discrepancy between DOT data and crash mapper data, but you know, this, we all know Atlantic Avenue is, you know, a very um, dangerous um, uh, street that has a lot of um, crashes. Um, but Skirmerhorn has, according to Crash Mapper, doesn't show as many crashes as as some of the other neighborhood um, streets. So those are my two questions. Thanks. For DOT. There we go. Sorry, we needed to unmute ourselves. Um, so thank you. Um, so to the first, the first question about the the parking. Um, so yeah, we we understand the the that back end parking has been a long standing issue. Um, we are continuing to both work with our sister agencies to address it, um, as well as looking at whether there are potential design elements that we can put in with this, concurrent with this, to, uh, to prevent it, especially from that blocking the sidewalk. Um, this design does, one of the things that we, that is important is that this makes, we make sure that, um, that if there, that parking does continue, um, it doesn't, it no longer impedes on either the travel lane or the bike lane. And so it, so it both accommodates it in the short term um, with all, but also we're continuing to look at longer term solutions. Um, and then just for the discrepancy with the crash data, um, it's likely just slight differences due to the different sources of data. We use our data is verified through the state uh, DMV that we use. So 
yeah, the, that data is uh, a very detailed data set that comes to us um, from New York State um, and has been, you know, uh, reviewed and cleaned and verified by our in-house data people. And it's the data set that is used across DOT for all our projects. I, I called on Patrick next, if he can unmute. Okay, I think I unmuted. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to Taya for uh, keeping the presentation going uh, and dealing with some uncommunity minded people. Thank you. Um, I uh, I I I'm definitely in support of this proposal. It's 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 a it's a tough street to even walk on, uh, it, even if you're on the sidewalk. So it's uh, I think this is a big improvement. Um, this this proposal and others related to uh, shared streets has obviously raised a lot of strong feelings about parking, about bike usage. Um, uh, I think it goes hand in hand with the changes, the massive changes we've seen in downtown Brooklyn. And uh, I would just ask DOT to, you know, stay in touch with us, stay on the case to uh, continue to watch as conditions change. Um, and then secondly, you know, um, like so many of the issues that arise in this committee, the bike, bikes, uh, Draw, you know, people biking unsafely is definitely an issue, but it is an enforcement issue. Um, and if there are some creative ways of addressing that, uh, you guys are probably the experts on how to how to figure out how to do that. But it's certainly not an easy problem to solve, um, but an important one. Thank you very much. Now, next one, we're going to call on John Do. John, you have to unmute yourself, and then I'll call Brian. I next. just un I just unmuted myself because okay. I was allowed to unmute. I'm I'm uh, glad to hear you, um, Sid, and I'm speaking to the downtown Brooklyn partnership also with this. There is no EIS. There's no environmental study of the impact of all of these changes on the adjacent neighborhoods, namely Borum Hill and uh, Fort Green. When they make all of these restrictions, for example, what they're doing on Skimmerhorn Street is supposed to eliminate the placard parking for the uh, New York City Transit. Where are those folks supposed to go? What impact does that have on adjacent neighborhoods? We can't have the placard parking extend into Borough Hill. We can't have the folks saying, well, we can't park on Skimmerhorn Street. We're driving in from Long Island or New Jersey. We're going to have to park on streets outside of the district. There needs to be an assessment. I heard that the trucks are going from Skimmerhorn Street to Atlantic Avenue. Atlantic Avenue is already a, a major issue. What are we doing to look at the overall impact of all of these changes on the adjacent neighborhoods. I ask Partnership and Skimmerhorn Street to address that. I wanna thank this uh, uh, presenter for giving us numbers, even though some of them are disputed. At least you gave us numbers to contemplate as you are making these requested adjustments. Uh, the same question I have for the partnership I have for you. Are you working closely with DOT? How much money is required to make all of these adjustments? How is it budgeted? Thank you, Sid. DOT, would you like to answer? Yeah, so um, just to the first part, you know, when we do a proposal like this, we do pretty extensive traffic modeling um, and not just on Skimmerhorn Street but of the adjacent streets around us. So including Atlantic Avenue, including the kind of larger downtown Brooklyn area. And we make sure that the 
rerouted vehicles um, can be accommodated uh, can be accommodated on those streets so that we're not going to be creating undue congestion on other streets um, with these changes. Um, and then just with the expense to the expense, it's all this is a in-house city project. It's done with DOT crews um, and it contracts that are already part of the DOT's funding. So um, yeah, we don't have those exact numbers, but I will say obviously this is a quick action project, um, which is as Ben said, going to be done in-house. So it is relatively inexpensive compared to what you would see with a capital project, one that would involve moving utilities um, or things of that nature. The next person I'm going to call on is Brian. Thank you. Um, question. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the protection afforded by, by parking um, should be uh, relatively reliable. Um, but at the intersections, there are like epoxy, gravel, sidewalk extensions. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, sometime last year or in the previous year, DOT was going to adopt a rule change to make it illegal to park in them. Um, in the same way it's illegal to park on a sidewalk. But as far as I know, that rule was never adopted. Um, and so on 4th Avenue, um, in Brooklyn, you have a lot of people who park in those sidewalk extensions and the traffic enforcement agency told me that they can't write tickets uh, for people who park there. And um, I'm wondering either, well, or both, uh, DOT can adopt that rule change um, so that people don't park in sidewalk extensions without fear of being ticketed. And also if there is sort of any sort of treatment like, you know, the planters that we saw in the, in the last presentation um, to prevent people from parking uh, in the sidewalk extensions, which we know they were. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to the first part. Um, I'm not as familiar, but to the design yet, we are looking at um, in those on those on those spaces at the corners, we are looking at possibilities, whether that's more quick curb, mm -hmm. whether that's bike racks, whether that's planters um, that can provide that kind of physical barrier in those spaces. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to look to to make to see that what we can do uh, to fortify to make sure that those spaces are not parked in illegally. Sandy, you want? I see your hand, Sandy. And then after Sandy, we're going to go uh, to uh, the community. Oh, and John Quinn. John, you're unmuted. Why don't you go first, and then come <clears throat> to Sandy? Sandy, get unmuted, and I'll call you next. Yeah, my, my question is the present parking that exists, what's the, what is it allowed? Who can park there? Is it, gen, is it the public? Is it, a, is it marked off for agencies? Um, there's, a, there's a mixture. Um, so there are parts, especially further uh, east, closer to Flatbush, where it is more, uh, gen, more metered parking for the public. Um, as you go for kind of closer to Smith Street, uh, Hoyt Street, there's more agency parking. I know there's some uh, NYSJ, uh, it's a whole alphabet soup of agencies. There's, what is it, Just New York State Justice Department, there's MTA police, there's courthouse parking. There's a lot of agency parking, especially closer to Smith Street. And then what's going to be after? So, yeah. So we're planning on maintaining the existing agency parking that is there. Some of it will be shifted a little bit, but the, those, those agencies that currently have parking spots um, will continue to have them um, during the daytime hour, during the hours that they're in place. So they're gonna have as many spaces. So all the reduction is gonna to be to general population parking. I don't want to. I don't want to give a, a total definite answer, but the majority of the space, the parking space that will be repurposed for the safety treatments is, yeah, will be daytime public parking or metered parking. Sandy, you're next. Sandy, if you can't unmute, I'm going to call on Lucy Coteen. Sandy Balboza. Sandy. Looks like she's trying. She's trying. Lucy, why don't you try to do it too so that with whoever gets first, I'll. Sandy, 
Just kidding. Now, okay, now I can. Um, a couple of comments. I don't, why, I don't know how you beat Sandy, but we got to get Sandy in after this. Go ahead. Sandy Balboza, is that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go, Lucy. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, one, I don't see the need for all these uh, painted pedestrian space and what did you call them? Quick curves. Seems like an enormous waste of space. I don't think we need to be babied that much. It's sort of insulting. So that's just a waste of space that could be used for more parking, which is at a premium, as you know. Um, another comment, we need that slip space from Skimmerhorn to Flatbush. It's a big mistake to remove that. That's a real choke point. And that saved a lot of trouble having that slip space onto Flatbush. And I don't understand the removal of that. And thirdly, why are you making, um, answer, why are you making the parking lane so wide? We, we, we know how to park. If you made them the normal parking width, then you could possibly have two lanes so that when the trucks or cars double park, then you can still move you know, down the other lane. So what's the purpose of such wide parking lanes? And please don't take away that slip space and put all those, those silly paintings on the ground. It's, just, it's really insulting to our intelligence. Sandy, are you finally unmuted? Let him answer, please. I don't think there's any answer. They're going to look at it. To, uh, ask them to look at it. They'll look at it. No, answer to the why the wide parking. What's the rationale? I can answer. I can address that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the wide part, it's a couple of, there are a couple of things. So one of the things that I mentioned are the existing curb extensions um, on the street that make it really narrow at points. Um, so there are parts where it's the width of skimmer horn vary, varies considerably um, in the way that keeping putting in two lanes uh, would be challenging. The other thing to note is the volumes on Skimmerhorn for vehicles are, 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 can easily be accommodated in one lane. They currently have one lane uh, for westbound traffic now, and so they'll continue, or for eastbound traffic now, sorry, and so they'll continue to have that, that amount of space to move. Were we to give them a, a put in a second travel lane, it creates a kind of wider, opener street that encourages speeding, and so by giving the one standard travel lane, uh, we kind of make, we try to make sure that that doesn't happen, but still have the width, um, not to insult your ability to park, but to make sure that if there is double parking or something going on like that, um, that there's still room to get around it and not block the travel lane. So you imagine the double parking will be squeezing into par partially into that parking lane, that wide parking lane? As people do currently when, you know, they'll double park close to the parked cars. And so we make sure there's enough room to get by. We we, don't, we, yeah, we as an agency certainly don't encourage uh, double parking. Um, however, we know and, you know, we think that these treatments will help discourage it along with the loading zones that will be installed throughout the corridor. However, we live in reality and we know this is New York and we know that it is going to happen. So we are um, making our design uh, that it can accommodate it when it does happen. Hopefully it will happen quickly and people will move on, but we want to make sure that the function of the street does not break down um, if and when that does occur um, for um, vehicles as well as pedestrians and cyclists. Okay, please reconsider all those wide, what do you call them? Quick, quick curb. Quick curbs and all that nonsense. It's, it makes the street so ugly also. Sandy, are you, are you still able to unmute? Sandy? Sandy, I'm gonna call to Nicole. Hopefully we'll, we're gonna try, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Sandy, you were just unmuted. Don't mute yourself again. Say, let her try one more time. Let, let's see if we can get her before I call on uh, Nicole. Oh, you're on mute. Go ahead. Talk, Sandy. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it going to stop? All right. Um, I'm from Atlantic Avenue. You D DOT presenters, can you hear me? Yes, yes. We, we can hear you. Okay. I'm from Atlantic Avenue. Um, you can't put any more traffic here. We're already getting traffic coming off of the, the trucks that, that aren't supposed to be on the BQE they're coming down Atlantic Avenue. So we're getting more traffic from the West. Um, you, DOT comes all the time. You talk about one area without um, having any comprehensive planning. Um, you're diverting 
trucks onto Atlantic Avenue from Skirmahorn now, so we're getting it from the east, from the west. Um, we don't have any room, so it's just going to back up to the other blocks because you can't get more here. And we're already at a standstill on Atlantic Avenue. Um, so uh, this, I, I, don't, I don't approve this plan. I hope the community board won't because there is no, there can't be any modeling. I, I can't believe that um, you've looked at the impacts uh, to the other streets, especially Atlantic Avenue, where you're saying to put, and these, are, these trucks are tractor trailers. They're not the little old fashioned trucks that we used to have. So, you know, we have, uh, and I, they look like more than 53 feet. Um, I just, very upsetting. I'm very angry at DOT because they treat Atlantic Avenue as a highway. We are a, connect, a connecting street, a connector, but we are also residential. We also are developing always our, our um, business community and um, the city just dumps on us. And I was involved in the traffic calming project for four years. And this is exactly what DOT shouldn't be doing. DOT, do you want to respond to that? Just, just to reiterate, I think that, you know, we do do extensive traffic modeling as well as observation in person and with video. Um, and we believe um, strongly that these um, improvements um, should be able to be incorporated without um, significant impacts to the adjacent streets. Okay. Well, what you, what you believe is not factual, and I don't believe you did any modeling. All right, next. Nicole? Um, a question and a comment. So one would be um, for, for the types of presentations, the comment. Um, it would be nice to either provide, if you can, some of that modeling as an appendix or something. Um, I believe you did the modeling, um, but it'd be nice to have as uh, something we can all reference and just say that we've seen it um, so that there's no he said, she said. Um, just a comment. And my question is um, for the loading zones. I saw that you had the hotel one, but is there any other space for loading zones uh, for deliveries and so on or uh, cabs? Yeah, we're, we're still working on the exact details of the um, of excuse me of the loading zones with our parking team, um, so we don't yet have a set answer. I think we're looking to see where they're where they're going to be most needed um, and prioritize those spaces. And I think um, if the members of the board or any members of the public have feedback that they want to share with DOT about where loading zones would be appropriate, um, you know that's something that we're always looking for additional feedback on. And it's also something that's fairly easy to adjust. Um, I noticed in the chat, there was a request about the loading zone. Um, and, you know, we would appreciate, I think that um, request in writing, be it maybe to the Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's office um, as well. Yeah, and Sid, thanks again for what you said in the early part about the cops, NYPD dropping off people at that building. So that's the kind of knowledge we need to make the design. So any other observations like that are also important. So it's you, were, you were present at that meeting, Ken. You were present at that meeting as well as I. So <laughs> <laughs> let's not forget who was there. Right. So now we're, now we're gonna do the community uh, comments. It's limited to two minutes, no personal comment. We, we, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. No one should be denigrated for, the, for what their opinions are. So, and also there's one person who's known, marked in as Zoom. I remind you that we require that you identify yourself when you speak. You don't have to say where you live, but your name, first name, last name are required. Just like if you would at a, at a hearing, you would have to sign your name in. We require that as well, okay? So the first one I have is Chad. It says Chad L Entertainment. I assume that's not your name. But whatever it is, we will let you do it. Chad? Okay, there we go. 
It, yeah, Chad, you got two minutes. Did it work that time? Yeah, you're 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 on. Go ahead. Okay, what a lovely image I have here. Um, <laughs> it, I I put everything into a direct message to Ben and Alicia. Um, I'm just concerned because I run a 99 seat theater on the south side of Skimmerhorn, just adjacent to the Hilton at a mixed use building that really needs pick up and drop off. There's also a ballet school. Um, for background, I'm a cyclist. I, I, I support uh, design streets. I'm down to give this a shot, um, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I've been working there for eight years. We've been open for 10 and I wasn't um, approached as uh, when this was designed. And I'm glad to hear that it shouldn't be too hard to request a drop off, pick up and drop off or loading zone that would accommodate both the theaters business, the ballet school's business. And also just to note that the tenants in the building um, are uh, people who routinely have need of emergency services. And so that the number of times per week and per day that there is a full fire or medical response on Skimmerhorn between Smith Street and Hoyt is like between two a day to, you know, two, I mean, somewhere between two a day to two a week. So I just think that should be factored in to a one way, one lane street that, I mean, last week had fire trucks, plural, parked on it for several hours, several times. Um, so Ben and Alicia, if there's some way that I should apply for dealing with the first issue first, if there's some way that I should apply for that pickup drop off loading zone to be added, can you offer me maybe in the chat or wherever a uh, you said the borough commissioner's office. Um, is there a specific email or person um, that I should target? And then what are we going to do about emergencies? That's it. Two, one, so done. <laughs> we'll try to put it up. In, we'll try to put it in the uh, chat, please. Thank you. Okay. And the next person is Justin Pollock. I just want to say briefly, said Chad, Emily in my office is from the Broken Bell Commission. Office. She can, she'll get the email to you, talk to her. Sorry, Sid. That's okay. That we allow. Uh, Justin, you're next. You should unmute yourself. Justin Pollock. You have to you have to unmute yourself. Taya, you have to allow him to unmute. Justin Pollock. And hold on. No, I know. There we go. Thank you. You have two minutes. Um, very good. Thank you all. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, Overall, did you consider putting the two-way bike lane on the north side of the street instead of the south side? Um, when I look at it, I starting from Borum Place, I see a church, a school, central booking. I see multiple hotels, a grocery store, Brooklyn Ballet, um, the child services. On the north side of the street, I see police parking. It seems to me that between all of those loading zones that need to go in on the south side, it would be actually much safer if the, the uh, bike lanes went in on the north side of the street. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but when I, I know the street pretty well, it doesn't seem like there's as many opportunities or, or need for loading zones there. Um, I also would ask that in looking at this and looking at the other streets around there, there's a city bike station that's been moved onto State Street. I'd like you to, as part of this, could you look at moving that city bike station onto Smith Street between Smith and Skemmerhorn? It's a big uh, connecting point for uh, bicyclists coming down J Smith, and they have to salmon to get to that bike. To that that bike, it would be great if it was just on Smith Street. Um, if this is successful, it'll mean uh, great biking coming from Fort Greene, but right now at Flatbush, there's no real way for a bicyclist to uh, ride legally to get onto you have, this you two have bike lane. seconds left. Yep. I'm just wondering if you're thinking about how to get bicyclists from Fort Greene onto this bike lane. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I'll address some of those points really quickly. Um, so yeah, the north side of the street versus the south side of the street, 
Um, there are a couple of reasons that we chose this, that we prioritize the south side. Um, one is that the the heaviest cyclist volumes are those connections from Hoyt onto Hoyt and onto Bond, uh, both from this to or from the south. So it makes those connections kind of more seamless. Um, the other is the north the north side of the street has um, has a higher number of uh, large dri large busy driveways, and so there are more we anticipated more frequent turns across the bike lane on the north side of the street. Um, and so to kind of reduce the amount of conflict points, we wanted to keep them um, on the south side there. Um, and just with respect to the city bike, to the city bike dock, the actual uh, best request, I saw Emily just put the number for their Brooklyn office in the chat. Um, if either by calling that number or contacting the Brooklyn office online, um, They'll be the best people to direct that to the right to the right people here at DOT for the city bike dock. Brendan Gibbons, you're unmuted. Brendan, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Brendan Gibbons. I'm I'm from the 400 and 500 State Street Block Association, and Third uh, Avenue is the intersection between our two blocks on State Street. So I I heard in your presentation that you're planning on moving trucks off Skemmerhorn. First of all, I wanna say that we support this plan. We support anything that helps to pedestrianize streets and work with transportation to make things better in our area. Um, are you planning on having trucks make a left-hand turn from Atlantic onto third? because right now that's not a legal turn. And as people have rightly pointed out, Atlantic Avenue is bumper to bumper with trucks and Third Avenue right now is one lane. It's a truck route, but it's one lane. That's not gonna change anytime soon. In fact, Alloy is going to take over the bus lane of Third Avenue and another lane. So it's going to go down to who knows how many lanes. So we have to uh, be mindful that Third Avenue uh, is going to have construction on it for probably about another decade. Um, the other thing to consider is that bikes traveling from west to east on Skemmerhorn make a right hand turn on Third Avenue and they encounter trucks and there's no bike lane on Third Avenue. Uh, there's nowhere for the bikes to go except a sidewalk that's a small sidewalk or ride in the middle of the street. So Third Avenue has to be part of this scope of work. It, it doesn't really make sense for it not to be. And um, I think now's the time to make it part of the, part of the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm just gonna say so we don't anticipate additional trucks making that left from Atlantic onto Third Avenue. Um, Thank you, Jeff Schwain. You're unmuted. Ben, would it be possible for you to show the first slide for you to screen share? Uh, the first slide. Yeah. Uh, give me one second. I think it's one of the the first maybe, or the second. Maybe, it may be difficult because of the countdown clock, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, I'll try to squeeze it in. Um, but but while you're pulling that up, um, I, I'm a bicyclist, and I just want to share that I don't think I don't think any driver can understand the amount of danger that we experience when we leave the bike lane. Um, and on Sherman, how much the bike lane is blocked. Uh, I think it's the very very first this one right here, <laughs> NYPD police in the bike lane. Obviously, this happens all the time on Shermerhorn. Obviously, it's not enforceable because I call 311 all the time on these police cars in the bike lane, and other vehicles get tacked, get like fined hundreds of dollars, but please don't. Anyway, my point is it's unenforceable, and we experience physical danger, not inconvenience, but like physical danger when we get out of that bike lane. Um, it feels like a lot of adrenaline in your body, it feels dangerous. So, my request is that. The quick curb, one, I wanna celebrate it. Uh, it helps us feel safe. And then two, uh, I would just like to make a comment for consideration for more quick curb 
because as we can see here, the police are going to do what they're going to do with the bike lane. And I just would close it with, I'd love to see dense, flexible delineators or quick curb to make sure that the protected bike lane is a protected bike lane. Thank you so much for the detailed presentation. I just want to say one thing about this. You know, the local, the new city council person did a, uh, a tape that's on YouTube about him trying to drive down Skirmelow yeah. Street. Yeah, uh, we... <laughs> So, so we're, we're, we're aware of the, the problem on Skirmerhorn Street goes back years and years again. Uh, Bill Harris, who, who you don't know, has been complaining about this for years. So we're, we're aware of the problem and we will try to get them to do whatever they can to try to make it safe for everybody on the street, whether it's pedestrian drivers. Our view of this is that we're trying to do everything. Now, there's no person. You. You're welcome. Zoom, you're unblocked. Yeah, sorry, you have it's to me. Identify, you have to identify. I can't. Yourself. I can't figure out how to put my name there. Well, just identify yourself now. Just oh, say Lorena. Lorena. No, what's your Lorena? last name? Lorena. What's your? No, we need your name. You know, for Lorena Allen. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I was just on Skirmerhorn today, and um, and I've been on that street many times. Uh, there are many, many, many city agencies on that street. Correct. Yes. Yes, many, many, many. I hope they have a list of all of them. It seems that like in some way um, that it would be good. Well, one, there are many city agencies there that have many people who work there and many people who are in various circumstances that need to go there. And it seems like there's a lot of people who need to drive. Um, but the um, it seems like it's going to be further complicated by the fact that I think State Street is now a closed street, I think I saw today. And then Hoyt Street is going to be a closed street. So that's gonna put further um, duress on the neighborhood. And I wonder, is there a better place for a bike lane? Um, the gentleman who spoke earlier, has he uh, thought of maybe, cause that is, seems like one of the craziest streets in the neighborhood, uh, maybe they might think, I know that Pacific Street, street has a, a one, I think that's a one way bike lane, but perhaps is there another street that they would find um, a better place for a bike lane? And so that's my three things. State Street seems to be closed. Hoyt Street is gonna be closed. Skirmerhorn sounds like, and Atlantic are so, so crazy. Like until we find out someplace to put these people and their needs and their cars, that closing down these streets is putting so much stress on us. Like in at Willoughby, I cannot tell you how much more traffic we're experiencing. So if we're experiencing a lot more traffic, I cannot imagine what is going to happen when you take away all the parking spaces that are there already for the people that go to those buildings. I know we want to get rid of cars and we want, I definitely want less fumes in my neighborhood. But um, where are these things gonna go? You can't just strangle a whole neighborhood and then say, we don't want you here. Like we need to find ways that they don't need those cars, not just to make life hell for so many people. Um, that's it. Thank you. Tom, you're next. You wanna try to unmute yourself? Hi there. Um, you're, you're unmuted. Great. Uh, my name is Thomas Hooji. Um, I'd just like to, State, state up front that I'm generally supportive of this plan. I'm looking forward to all the safety improvements it's going to deliver for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, I encourage the community board to formally endorse the plan, um, provided that DOT uh, address a few des design issues that I've noticed. Um, I think the main flaw with the plan is that it's still dependent on enforcement. Uh, a 10 foot wide two way bike lane with a three foot, foot buffer still creates enough width for drivers to drive into the bike lane. Um, I celebrate the proposal of the two-way bike lane. I think it's a great idea, but the egress points, the actual points of entry and exit need to be protected as well. I think DOT should reference the Hudson River Greenway as an example of how to properly protect the bike path. There are ball bollards along the path that allow cyclists and pedestrians to pass, but cars cannot. Um, I think in the first iteration of the plan, you should maybe try piloting a kind of like a quick curb bollard. So you don't have to actually install a concrete one. I know DOT is hesitant to do that, but use a quick curb to, to basically create a vertical delineation. Um, I think the second major concern is that your parking protected bike lane depends on drivers legally parallel parking, um, and you need to enforce that legal parallel parking. Uh, unfortunately, as we know on Shermerhorn, there is a contingency of drivers who park perpendicular to the curb, 
and even on top of the curb on Trimmerhorn. Um, I have every reason to believe that we're going to see this pattern repeated on the south side of the street and cars will simply end up parking in the bike lane. Um, I think the committee should recommend that DOT upgrade the bike lane protection uh, to the new hardened model that Mayor Adams has introduced uh, with either concrete barriers or just another quick curb that basically physically separates the, the parked cars from the two-way bike lane so that they're not encouraged to bike in it. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, that's all I, I see have had their hands up will want. So at this point, uh, the, the DOT is not asking, oh, but it, is that, no, that's one. No, might, no, 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 sorry. That's, no. that's okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to call on you anyway. So, uh, uh, so the, the, does DOT want to, uh, uh, give a closing, closing on this or, or are you done? I would just say uh, thanks for again for all the feedback we got from everyone. We were taking all the comments and we'll get back to you with more details because as uh, Ben and Alicia and Emily said, even though a lot of the plan is outlined and we're confident in it, it is some things that uh, we are going to change, particularly on the parking regulations that we've heard tonight. And that's what we're going to get back to people on. So we will get back to you and let you know. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in June on the uh, on the Willoughby Avenue uh, report. I'll be there. Okay, so I'm going to make a, a the the chair the uh, uh, again we've a, the uh, number of people have asked DOT to remain for the community forum. I don't know if they're going to. Uh, the chairperson's report. I'm going to make a quick. Uh, the MTA has announced they're going. They're issuing commemorative Biggie Small uh, Metro cards that you can only get at stations in the community board too, that one of them is Atlantic Avenue. There's 50,000 of them and they're going to be issued uh, with the within the next beginning on the 21st. And if you want a Biggie Smalls commemorative MTA card, uh, please feel free to apply. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the uh, uh, police report, uh, the, the, the police reports, the 8-4 and the 8-8 police report uh, show increases this year in, all, in every category except murder. In both the uh, murder, the two uh, districts are down, uh, but we know that it's up, up city wine. It's a continuing problem. Homelessness is a continuing problem. And Taya just put up the biggie small uh, 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 thing. And now I have one other thing. Uh, I asked the, uh, the uh, COIB, the Conflict of Interest Board, a question about whether or not because the Borm Hill Association uh, has been the sponsor of two open streets, whether or not I'm conflicted out. And it turns out, according to their preliminary report, I'm waiting for a formal response, is that I am conflicted out of voting on the open streets program uh, as a whole program. And I'm also uh, obviously conflicted out of having anything to do with the, uh, the Borm Hill Association. I'm not conflicted out on voting on something concerning Will it, will it be Avenue, all right? All right, so I will continue obviously when we do Will it be Avenue, if we're doing something other than open streets, other than Willoughby Avenue, I will step down from the chair for that, for those discussions until I get a formal opinion from the community, from the uh, conflict of interest board. All right. So that's the uh, chairperson's report. Is there any other committee business? Hearing none, are there any people willing to speak in community forum? And I know obviously that Juliet wants to. So let's unmute Juliet and hear what Juliet has to say. Thanks, Sid. Um, I just wanted to um, communicate to DOT uh, what a resident of my old building, Torin at Merle and Flatbush, um, had asked me to communicate. Um, there is a loading zone for the supermarket there that is um, not used as a loading zone. It, it's used as private parking. The supermarket actually um, has their delivery trucks park on Flatbush Avenue 
and block traffic, Flatbush Avenue extension, um, just south of Myrtle Avenue. It blocks traffic often during the morning rush hour um, because they don't use their loading zone, which was um, already designed, designated, permitted, and approved for them for actual loading. So um, this person, this resident had put in about 20 uh, tickets into 311. Oftentimes they get closed out. Sometimes they get closed out without any um, action. So I just wanted to um, bring it up to DOT. Um, Emily, I, if you're still on the phone, um, I did uh, just email you the ticket numbers so it, and, the, and the person's email address. So if you could follow up, that would be great. Thank you. The next is uh, the other Sandy. Thank you. I keep thinking I'm the only one, but okay. Um, I want to put on the record that open streets hostage taking of Willoughby and South Portland Avenue without the required environmental impact study is, sorry, a screw you to our community. I also want to be clear that the DOT's sham so-called survey likely crafted in collaboration with the uh, transportation alternative people fool no one. 800 actual residents signed a petition against it. Open streets are closed streets, and it is an anti-democratic, Putin-esque taking of public streets and public free access. The open streets program began on an emergency basis, yet has now permanently handed over our rights as New York City residents by kidnapping public space, shutting up residents, and catering to the lobbyists and self-entitled biker bros. The program has betrayed any number of Fort Greene elderly and disabled residents who've been victimized by an inability to get accessoride door-to-door -door service, and that defies the federal ADA law. The closed streets in Fort Greene were short-circuited, untransparently produced, executed under the cover of darkness, and imposed, like it or not, just the way it's done in a banana republic. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. You're next. Daryl, you need to unmute. Okay. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Daryl Rock. Um, I'm a longtime resident of um, this district. I've lived here for over 30 years, 40 years. I've worked here. Um, I, I want to speak about the Gates Avenue project that, that was proposed. Um, I live where I live on Gates Avenue is right abut the um, where the project is going to be. Myself, along with 32 other families, live here. And our objection is for that project is that the the noise factor alone will be a a, a big inconvenience for the people that that live here. Um, we know most of these plazas are in commercial areas. This area where I'm talking about is a strictly residential street where all of these, all of the residents like five feet away from the windows will, will be where this project is. Um, <clears throat> so we're very much against it. We had a meeting on April 28th and we had a chance to speak to DOT and we made it clear to them that we're not in favor of this project whatsoever. Also there's the, um, the parking spots that we'll lose, we will lose about seven parking spots. Maybe somebody else could speak to that later, but. Um, for my years being here, the reason why people move, have to move is because there's no parking, and it's particularly for the elderly. And the third thing is, I think, which may be more important than anything else, is the disrespect that was shown to the people that live here. Why were we not informed at all about a project that's going to impact us more than anybody else? Like I said, it's adjacent to our building, and it, it's the survey that was done, any middle school statistics student would know that it was implicitly biased. So, and also at the time that we had a workshop, uh, one of the members was disrespectful to us. I made a complaint and they did apologize, but we deserve better. We lived here, like I said, I've been here for 40 years. This should not be happening. Daryl, your, time, not be done Daryl, in a way Daryl, your time is up, thank you. Rachel, you're next. Please Zoom is next, uh, Lorena is next. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have to get back there. I'm um, sorry. Uh, just quickly, um, I just would like to add and I will comment further uh, on, on the other meeting um, that is coming up that was supposed to be tonight. Um, 
a host of problems has occurred on um, Willoughby. I believe that it's a more dangerous street and that these concerns have not been addressed. Um, it just, I, I, it seems that the, that every concern is taken as a, a full on opposition. And then there's this name calling that happens, but I will tell you, I live on the Willoughby street and I know that it is more dangerous. I witness incidents every time I go out. Um, and then I guess I'll just comment more later. It's, um, but it's caused a host of problems and the congestion is up so much. It, it starts at you know eight and it goes until like one and multiple streets are extremely congested. Um, so we are suffering from that with um, the exhaust fumes that come with that. And anytime we have a movie and all kinds of other things that are causing um, more emissions and exhaust fumes in the air in the neighborhood and it's causing stress on us and our health. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, you're next. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm here presenting with my colleague for the Smith Street bid formation effort. We've recently pivoted from Court Smith to Only Smith, but we're presenting an op we're we're hoping to do open streets on Smith Street uh, Saturdays during the day from 11 a.m. to 6 a.m. starting Saturday, July 9th, ending August uh, 27th. Uh, the open street was start from Union Street ending at Wyckoff Street. So it goes, uh, CB6 has already approved it, but we are budding it and we want to uh, get input from the community moving forward. We have talked to a lot of businesses on the street uh, in the last week. We've gotten broad support both this year as well as in previous years for this. Is this one day kind of, a week? Um, How many days a week are you asking for? It's one day a week on Saturdays. It's one day on the weekend. It's Saturdays. Yes. It's... So um, if I could just help Rachel, because her, um, her audio is also glitching. So Rachel and the second of the next um, commenter are both from organizations that actually wanted to speak on tonight's agenda, but the agenda was too full. Um, Rachel represents a new bid that is attempting to form and they have been working with the DOT to get an approved uh, open streets in their area. Rachel, is your audio back? Uh, I don't know, can you hear oh, me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. So we've spoken both to businesses on the area as well as, uh, as well as residents. As I said, the open street is gonna be on Saturdays only from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. starting at Union Street, ending at Wyckoff Street. So we're really talking about Warren to Wyckoff Street, um, which is part of your, yours. And this is really come from the community that they need more space. Smith Street on the weekends is very crowded, the, the, the sidewalks. See, this is Esther. Are we, is the community board now um, putting input on open streets where we wasn't in the past? No, they're just, this is just informational. No. They just wanted no. us, the board to know about it. Oh, because she said something about asking for our support. That I, I thought that's what I heard. Okay, thank you. Again, you get all your satisfaction outside. And I come here, you come here to eat and sleep. Okay, Ms. Rachel? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Esther, I just wanted to clarify that uh, their group will, may, um, oh, I'm sorry, my camera's off too. A lot of a lot of technical things tonight. Um, their organization may return to the committee if they need a letter of support for their bid formation tonight. They just wanted to share that the open street is happening. I believe Salane Sharma, are you? Yeah, let me unmute you as well. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Rachel. Um, Rachel and I work together on the Smith Street bid formation effort, which. Um, yes, uh, Taya, we will certainly come back and you know um, present more formally on. Uh, but as far as the open streets goes, you know, this is uh, something we started actually in 2021, um, where we just started polling the community and seeing uh, businesses along that corridor, 
what their interest level was. We held a community meeting at Union Grounds inviting everyone to come out. Um, it's been in uh, newsletters on social media. Um, we can drop our, our social media handle on um, chat as well, just to be able for, for all of you to connect with us. Um, but we are all local residents. We live and work and own businesses, properties, and, and you know, homes in the, the neighborhood. So very much would love to, uh, you know, just, just hear from all of you. And thank you again for, for hearing us out tonight. Thanks. Okay, I think Artie, Artie Mehta is next, and she is also from a local organization that was not able to be on the agenda tonight. And I'm gonna help her by sharing a screen with some information. Uh, sure. Um, thank you, uh, Taya, for unmuting uh, me. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Artie Mehta. I'm a project manager at Perch Advisors, uh, which, which is a community engagement focused uh, consulting firm. Uh, I'm here this evening to share information about a green initiative that, if supported, would intend to help to overcome persistent transportation challenges, um, such as safety, accessibility, and accountability, as well as driver, uh, de uh, sorry, deliver environmentally clean transportation that would reduce uh, local air pollution. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you a bit of context about our community partner, Dollar Ride. Uh, they, are, they were recently named as a finalist for New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, uh, Authority's Clean Neighborhood Challenge. Uh, and I'm uh, dropping the link uh, in the chat for, for you to just uh, have more information. The, uh, this challenge, Clean Neighborhood Challenge Prize, will enable Dollarite to activate electric dollar vans along the Flatbush and Utica Avenue. Uh, their team is working to produce a final proposal for the opportunity. There is a town hall in-person meeting that is scheduled over the next weeks uh, where Dollaride will share more in-depth information and continue to gather feedback. Uh, and I'm sharing again uh, the RSVP link for the town hall meeting in the chat. Uh, I hope uh, that you all will join us, but if not, uh, I hope that you will take a five minute survey uh, uh, and I'm dropping the link for the surveys in the chat. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, here are the links uh, and yes, please feel free to uh, message me or email me on my email uh, ID that I'm providing again in the chat for more information about the project. Thank you. Some of the board members may recall that I um, shared a brief announcement about this at the board meeting as well. Um, the timing of their request and their award just didn't align with the timing of scheduling this meeting, so they were not able to be on the full agenda. And Mr. Singletary suggested that they come and present a little more detail to this particular committee. Thank, thank you, Tara. Okay, I see two people. Arda commented. Was Arda already on? I think she was. So, John, uh, Esther, why don't you go first? You need to unmute. Give it a second. Okay. Um, I don't know if the proposal is that um, open streets will be coming before the community board in the future. I don't know if I'm wrong on that subject, but I want to throw out this too. Um, open Street, the people who get a, um, approved for Open Street have to renew every year. Just like liquor licenses and stuff, that should be coming before the community board so the community could say what complaints they have, what, what is not working. And so that should be something that the community boy should be thinking about if we can do that i know okay i agree with you john you want to say something and i think lucy wants it lucy cookie wants to say something i heard you i see your hand lucy john lucy if you can unmute i'm on i think i'm unmuted go ahead go ahead okay. lucy 
So I have a num number of questions for DOT, which I hope they can answer at the next meeting. Um, but first, before I go, um, I, I, Tara, sorry, Taya, Taya sent out Taya. Uh, something I had sent to everybody. Taya, her name is Taya. Taya, sorry, Taya. Um, the letter from Wanu, which is the Willoughby Avenue Neighborhoods United Block, they sent out that letter and also a bunch of comments about the open streets and the problems with it, the Willoughby open street. So I hope everyone got a chance to read those. I, I, I understand they were sent out. But my first question is, why does DOT and other people want to increase congestion, noise pollution, and air pollution? That is the only outcome of the open street program. And I would like an answer to that. We, you know, you've heard it over and over, congestion is much worse. Cars are honking because it's stuck in traffic. The air pollution is worse. Okay, next question. What is wrong with the sidewalks? They've been working just fine for many years. On Willoughby Avenue, the sidewalk is particularly wide. Three, um, going to Gates Avenue and what Mr. Rock had to say. What is the connection between closing Gates Avenue between Fulton and Vanderbilt and the killing of the child? Has there been an investigation into the police chase that caused the accident? Why did DOT, DOT make the plan even worse by planning to make Gates Avenue between Vanderbilt and Clinton one way? Next question. Is there anyone who, here who thinks that closing streets reduces cars on the road? Next, number five. Is there anyone here that thinks that removing parking spaces makes less traffic and reduces cars on the road? Next. Who who are the specific members of the Fort Green Open Streets Coalition that asked for Willoughby Avenue and South Portland Avenue to be closed? And where do they live? Why can just anyone set street policy in New York City? Where is that written in the charter? Seven, why does Dio think it's appropriate- Lu to Lucy, you're, 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 you're two minutes are almost up. Okay, and it's, and it's one more. Why does DOT think it's appropriate to make life harder for seniors, the disabled, and for pregnant women by placing barriers to their homes? And why did DOT call something a survey about street closures that was clearly a request to approve the closing? Do they not comprehend the idea of an unbiased Okay, survey? Lucy, your time's up. All right, thank you. I got a few more, but no, I got a lot of- No, time's up. John Dew's right. next. I want answers, by the way, not just so- John, it, Lucy, this is open comment. There's no, they don't have to respond to this. You could ask DOT anything you want to, but that doesn't, during these comment periods, it's just a time for people to comment. They don't have to respond. You can put it in writing to them. Why don't you write a letter to them? Andrew, you're unmuted. Finally, Taya, I'm not quite sure why I stay muted all this time not able to communicate. In any event, I wanted to say to the community and said to the committee, we need to ask DOT for an overall downtown Brooklyn partnership plan. That includes all of community board too. We are building up this community with all these excess, very high buildings. We got nine DeKalb that's about to come online. Who knows what? kind of traffic it's going to be generated by the tallest building in Brooklyn. We just lost a permanent lane on the BQE cantilever. How are we accommodating all of the needs? We're trying to be all things to all people downtown Brooklyn with no more streets. It's getting to a point of road rage for so many folks in cars because we're doing everything we can to discourage car driving while we're creating all these attractions to bring people into the district. We need to have an overall plan for traffic for community district two. Thank you. Thank you, John. Ernie, you wanna say something? No, I'm gonna hold my comments uh, until the next meeting with DLT. Uh, you know, my observation, one, I'll go on record again as being opposed to uh, the Gates Vanderbilt um, street closure. It's totally irrational uh, and, it's, um, uh, and it's totally divorced from reality. You know, there's no, uh, and it's gratuitous. So uh, 
I'll raise my, all a lot of objection, uh, and we're going to continue meeting uh, with members of the community. We are going to continue meeting with our uh, local uh, city council woman, uh, Crystal Hudson, who has the um, ability to have a conversation and to listen. Uh, that's as much as we can ask of her at this moment, but uh, it's important and we, I'm appreciative of her uh, uh, function as a representative in terms of- You gained a bit of weight. Uh, Okay. Uh, okay, Ernie. Uh, listening. All okay. right. So I'll talk to you All right. next. Week. Nicole, you you want to say something, and that'll be the end of it. Nicole. Nicole will be the last person on the open on the. Uh, yes, I had to before. unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. I just wanted to mention to some folks who might be listening and don't join our meetings regularly that um, there are some members on this community board who do support uh, generally pedestrianization and open streets, and I count myself as one of them. That's all. All right, thank you. All right, uh, uh, there not being any further business, can I get a motion to adjourn? Okay, Sandy making the most, second by John Quint. All in favor say aye. Thank you everyone and good night and safe walking, driving, biking. <laughs>